Hey guys, Tom here. Before we dive into this episode, I just want to tell you about a few awesome free resources we have available for anyone watching this video. Firstly, if you head over to my website, thomasbrettmixing.com, you can download a free 70 page ebook I've put together called Mixing Simplified. Within this book, you'll find tons of tips, tricks, and advice on how you can go about achieving great sounding mixes in the simplest, most easy to understand way possible. You should get a pop-up asking if you'd like to download the PDF when you first arrive on the website, but if you don't, you can also find links at the bottom of every page or on the store section of the website. Aside from the free ebook, if you head over to the blog section of the website, you'll also find a huge collection of educational articles that I've written over the years for top audio education platforms like the Pro Audio Files, Unstoppable Recording Machine, and Joey Sturgis Tones. One final thing before we get on with the video. In the very near future, me and Max are planning to do some video segments where we review your music. If you'd like us to potentially take a listen to one of your tracks and give you some fairly in-depth feedback and advice on what you can do to improve the mix, recording, songwriting, structure, or pretty much whatever we hear in the track, feel free to submit a link to your song using the Contact Us page of the website, along with your contact details. Every now and then, we'll pick out a few random submissions to include in our upcoming videos. Anyway, let's get back to the podcast. So I will do a slight introduction again. So for people who are okay. just tuning in, this is uh, me and Max's new chat program, Unscripted, where we uh, talk about all things music production related, music, songwriting, mixing, recording, mastering, whatever we feel like. And we try to do it as unscripted as possible. So each week we're just going to be choosing a topic um, that we both agree on that we'd like to talk about and then just going from there and seeing what happens. So I think for this episode, uh, Max, we are going to be talking about songwriting which is i think a topic that is very dear to both of our hearts yeah it's very dear and it's also quite rare maybe i'm just not following enough channels on youtube i've been watching countless tutorials on engineering on recording and mixing and whatnot but when it comes to songwriting i'm sure there are some yeah. great materials covering the topic but to me it's always been something more of an intuitive thing it's probably that it's a less know, technical thing, you know, so... Yeah, so talking about songwriting is a totally... I mean, I cannot copy someone else's no. mindset you when talking about songwriting. You can't give exact frequencies or exact settings like you can in mixing. With songwriting, it's yeah. more just, you know, you just develop yourself and... Yeah, I think our brains in this aspect are like giant shakers and first you load components into those shakers into those blenders and mm -hmm. push the button mm -hmm. and the more components you have and the better those components are the better the end cocktail yeah. which is your own songs yeah. will be so having great foundation having great background when it comes to what you've been listening through your childhood years then growing up how many different genres you cover and it doesn't mean that you gotta listen to all sorts of music it means like being um being an explorer as a listener in a certain period of your you know growth yeah your uh, maybe childhood years, maybe teenage years, <coughs> especially teenage years. I remember watching someone, someone's um, YouTube channel. I can't really remember who, but they said um, that for any musician, for any super mature musician, let's say a jazz musician who is great session player and he can read music mm -hmm. in real time, properly read music, mm -hmm. but if they were listening to new metal when they were 13 years old new metal will still be the most touching the most emotionally you know evolving thing yep and uh that makes sense because i think music is if not the first is it's the second thing that makes us very emotionally resonant mm. after after smelling things you know after after this after I, I mean, when I smell autumn, I instantly feel like I'm a little kid again who just yeah. walks to school for the first time. And same with music. When you're listening to the song that you haven't heard for maybe 20 years, and all of a sudden you hear it. So many things, so many old neurons get, you know... It's like the song you listen to at a certain time of your, of your life, it will form a web in your brain and connect to everything that's going on in your life at that point. Like Yeah, exactly. I can, exactly. You can tell me a song and I will instantly 
remember where I heard it or what was going on at the time, how I was feeling, who I oh, was yes. with. There's just so many things and it's, it's crazy. Which bands or which artists were the first artists you heard that like uh, got you into rock and metal and, and made you feel like, oh, this is an awakening. This is what I want to yeah. do. This is what I like. This is my taste. I, like, do you remember? I think it ha Yeah, I remember clearly. Uh, I guess the, it has something to do with... Uh, with the teenage, the teenage, uh, you know, mutations in the body. So when you finally uh, feel the first romantic, uh, you know, have the first romantic feelings to to a girl, for instance, yeah. and the same with the music. All of a sudden, you start getting new emotions from music. And for me, those were mm, animals, the, the old old rock and roll band. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was very much into sixties when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So it was animals. It was bills. Obviously, I heard yeah, yesterday yeah. on on the radio, and 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 the cellos there. Somehow they just moved me. I loved British rock, and I loved Oasis when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just a few songs, but great songwriting again. Very, very, yeah. very catchy. Yeah. So I was very lucky to have very nice bands uh, from from giving me that initial push into. Mm -hmm making music. Uh, I just realized when I yes when I was 12, maybe 13 years old, I want to make music. Mm. I didn't really understand who I want to be. I didn't understand if I want to be a singer or a guitarist or whatever. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be a musician. I wanted to make music. Mm -hmm. And I was first I was probably I was just copying the house of the rising sun for the first couple of dozen of tries. And such a an immortal uh, song, so to say. Uh, Such a great, real, great voice. A riff everyone knows, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very simple, it's very basic. Every guy with a guitar somewhere in the backyard can sing that song to his mates or to the girls. That was a, what, That's what I was trying to do I, when I got my first guitar. <laughs> so um, it moved me a lot when I was in my early teenage years. Yep. And probably because I, I could never choose whom I wanted to become, uh, it made me who I am now, the producer and the multi-instrumentalist in a way. Because I remember I was listening, a few years later, I was listening to Grand Funk Railroad. Mm -hmm. So I was into 70s <laughs> yeah. uh, when I was like 16 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and into early prog and rock became more complicated, like the Purple Mark II mm -hmm. and Grand Funk Railroad and King Crimson and this and that. And I, well, I was closing my eyes and I was imagining myself playing bass. But as soon as I heard the vocals, I was imagining myself playing bass and singing. But then when I heard a great drum feel, I was imagining myself being a drummer. I couldn't really decide because I loved all this music so mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was very lucky to go through the decade of, two decades of rock music while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So I covered 60s, 70s, 80s, and then... I started recording my first bands when I was like 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And those were the bands who were very much into black metal, death metal, um, maybe symphonic metal. Mm -hmm. And it was late 90s. I started listening to those records involuntarily. So Cradle of Filth, Nightwish, mm -hmm. and so on and so on, yeah. totally different bands. Mm -hmm. And those bands were us usually very amateur, so I had to arrange synths for them, for them, program drums, sometimes play something, so I had to study those recordings. I yep. had to <laughs> capture the samples. You know, you're going through the album, you're finding a drum fill, you're yep. grabbing all the toms and snare and kick a from there. Kick, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you create sample library, sound fonts. Yeah. Uh, for sound blaster, mm -hmm. sound card, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very very simplistic libraries of your own, and that that's how you produce the band when you are just a little kid mm -hmm. in a room mm -hmm. with the sound blaster and the cheap Roland amplifier. But again, that was a great experience for me because I had the background from all the way to the sixties, from the sixties to the 90s mm -hmm. and then I was just following the music all, all along like from, from the late 90s and up until now together with my clients because the clients always wanted something that was trending and I was following that. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is your, your favorite 
genre if you had to pick one your favorite genre your favorite couple of bands like the ones that have had the biggest impact on you even uh, if even if they haven't haven't had an impact on your music the ones that have had an impact on you as a musician and your love for music i can tell you yeah i think i can tell you um <clears throat> i will definitely name black sabbath because black sabbath is a whole wide array of subgenres of metal starting from proto metal in 1970 with very slow doom like music and very raw sounds and uh, obviously Ozzy as a singer was very non metal in the 80s understanding of mm. how the metal singer should sound mm -hmm. and then you have Dio and then you have Tony Martin with some of the their best albums in my opinion mm -hmm. so when i'm saying i'm a fan of black sabbath i'm a fan of that wide array of things i can learn from them mm -hmm. but if you want to be a great composer of riffs you gotta definitely study black sabbath you gotta study tony iomi because oh, of yeah, how of course, he yeah. writes his riffs mm. the, and those riffs are good enough to just you know i don't want to go through the whole song i just want to hear the intro yeah and the riff is so great okay let me hear another riff now uh, even though they have lots of huge, huge hits, and I am obviously a huge fan of Tony Martin's voice and Ronnie James Dio's voice. So, Black Sabbath would probably be uh, the band number one, and band number two would be Judas Priest. Mm -hmm. Again, classic metal, but totally different. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say Judas Priest, I probably mean Rob Halford, so Priest and also solo Rob Halford's albums. Because his solo albums were so full of energy and, and so, for instance, he had a band Fight, it was pure thrash metal, three albums, very fresh, very American, uh, opposed to the British, very British sounding Priest albums. Mm -hmm. Then he had a couple of solo albums, uh, uh, Resurrection, Live Insurrection and, and Crucible, which are very also very important for me. So. Even though I'm I'm very much into progressive music, I think my songwriting was more uh, shaped, more influenced by these bands. But at the same time, I cannot say that it was only influenced by those bands because earlier in my life, when the foundations of how I think melodically were formed, I think I got more I I got more from Beatles, I got more from let's say Jethro Jethro Tal song yeah. <laughs> for stuttering uh from uh, even from some pop bands like ABBA which which were very mm. popular in yeah. in my childhood and I was just hearing them their songs all the time so my melodical thinking and even earlier Deep Purple records with with very heavy keyboard arrangements. So Black Sabbath and especially Judas Priest are mm -hmm. just guitar driven bands. Yep. But I I love great synth arrangements. Mm -hmm. I, I just love synths. And I also love analog synths like in prog rock mm -hmm. music. So it's very hard to answer the question directly mm -hmm. because even though i know what shaped my songwriting in metal mm -hmm. i think that my melodical um thinking was shaped earlier by yeah. the bands that i i'm not such a great fan of right now yeah yeah so we say no that's that's and very interesting yeah yeah but at this point i think it's it's all about it's been all about me. I'd love to hear your part of the story <laughs> because it's so different. And I'm I'm more of a producer, but you are yeah. you are the songwriter. You are actually <laughs> making making it like your career right now. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because you were mentioning you were start you you mentioned you you first listened to music at the age of like four, but you were saying you you felt like the the music you were listening to was forming a bit more a bit later on with like the Beatles and like. ABBA and those kind of things in terms of like the pop understanding of uh, melodies and stuff and it's interesting because I was thinking of it like before this talk I was thinking just trying to recollect like when did I first truly start getting into music properly and which bands was it and like interestingly enough when I was growing up 
the the thing we'd listen to the most uh, my dad would my dad and mum uh, they're both musicians they're hugely oh. into music they're both my my dad's a guitarist my mum's a, a pianist so mm-hmm. um they always had music going in the house or in the car and the things we'd listen to the most as kids was revolver and rubber soul by oh, the yes. beatles so same kind of thing so you talk about yesterday and uh, this that's what i grew up listening to so yeah i i absolutely loved those two albums those are the albums we listened to the most um, very early on when I was really young and obviously we loved the albums we listened to them but you don't you don't quite like fully get into music at the age of like four or five really it takes yeah. a bit more time but yeah I still love those albums I love the Beatles and I think I'd agree same kind of thing in terms of my understanding of songwriting and hooks and pop melodies and all that like although later on I got into a lot of metal stuff I still go back to like I I'm I'm a sucker for hooks and pop melodies regardless of genre if someone came to me wanting to do a black metal album i'd still try and make hooky choruses you know like exactly. try and make it work but yeah so started out with the beatles um we'd listen to a ton of queen david bowie um and then progressing from that kind of stuff that was so that was more my my mom and dad's influence because they were obviously uh, born in the 60s um, and they grew up with that kind of stuff. So that's that was their music, and we loved that. I still love all that stuff. But then if I think about the, the songs that truly first influenced me and developed my tastes, the first one that comes to mind is I, I, I remember seeing Californication, the music video, uh, mm-hmm. on MTV probably. And I think, I'm not sure if it was 99 or 2000, one of those years, but that was when... I feel like my eyes were first truly opened, you know, in terms of like, ah, I've really you liked this. You found your calling. Yeah. But it was, it, in a way, the Chili Peppers were kind of cheating with that. And I think it's a great tactic because they had the video game kind of music video, mm-hmm. which is like extremely, a, a great way to kind of get kids into watching, to listening to your music as well. So like, I think I was probably struck more by the visuals first and then with time, like, oh yeah, the song is amazing. I love the song, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um and then from there, I mean, I, I'm, I'm as I, as I said in the previous talk, I'm like ten years younger than you, so not quite the same generation. But uh, I grew up around the time when new metal was the the big thing. So new metal, Linkin Park, Linkin Park, for mm-hmm. example, is probably one of the most influential influential bands for me. Um, although I really evolved from there later on, in terms of like. Like a lot of metal people hate on Linkin Park, you know, like, but in terms of songwriting and hooks and like um, bringing metal to the mainstream and making metal mix with pop, like there's very few examples that have done it as well as as Linkin Park, if any, you know, like um, yeah. songs like... One of those bands, one of those bands that it's very hard to give them precisely one genre. Yeah. A person who is just not into music or not into rock music would probably really enjoy mm. uh, one of their biggest hits. Well, they're 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 always called the the gateway band, aren't they? The gateway drug into getting oh, yes. into to, to rock, getting it's more pop term, minded people into into rock or into metal. You know. But yeah, I do this like you you mentioned like listening to music with like earbuds or headphones and like imagining things and and like just purely because back then like we didn't. We did have the internet, but it was so early. It wasn't a big thing. People weren't on the internet 24-7 all day long on phones or computers, you know? It was just a an extra thing you'd do once in a, once in a while, you know? Um, but I had same same kind of experience. I had my little Sony Walkman CD player, you know? And I had the... Oh, the, yes. The Linkin Park CDs. And, and my one of my earliest memories of... My earliest memory of, like, truly being into music for the first time was, like... My little Walkman, my Linkin Park CDs. I'd go to school in the mornings early, like an hour early before anyone else, and just sit in the garden of the school, sit on the bench or sit on the wall, and put on my Linkin Park CD, and just listen to the full album from start to finish. You know? How old were you? I don't know, probably eight or nine or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you were listening to the whole album and what you were imagining. Yeah, I was, listening. I was listening. To, so you're pure, truly listening to the lyrics and listening to Chester Bennington singing what he's singing about and actually connecting with the story rather than just listening yeah. as a consumer, which is what we do a lot now nowadays because, you know, culture has changed. And nowadays yeah. when we're listening to music, we're usually doing something while we're listening to music. 
exactly. That's so sad that people are missing. So many yeah. people are missing the pure joy of listening yeah. of, of 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 the I'd call it ritual of listening. Yeah. A ceremony of listening. Yeah. So I, I I count myself lucky to still be of that generation before the culture changed. Really. Yeah, definitely. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I will tell you a story it. later just, uh, about Walkman. <laughs> yeah. It's just the value of a, the value of a song, and you can you can see that shift in every aspect of the music business. You know, like uh, bands used to spend months doing albums. Bands, uh, you know, you spend months in the studio working on a exactly. full project, whereas now with million budgets, yeah, tiny budgets, yeah. no time. A song, a song is way less valuable. A song needs to be okay. Get the song done, release it. Within a couple of weeks, it's a content now. Just it's content, co- it's content, not art content. And there's so much of it, and and it's so like it's so easy to just uh, listen to a song. Oh, I don't like the skip. Oh, I don't like yeah. the skip to the next one. Oh, this one's okay. Listen to a bit. I'll oh, get through the middle of get to the middle of the song. I'll oh, skip. Whereas back in the day, like with the Walkman example, I had yeah. five CDs. You know, if I wanted to switch from CD to CD, I could do that. But I didn't have. Five thousand, five million, fifty million CDs. I had five. I had a couple of Linkin Park albums, you know, maybe a Red Hot Chili Peppers album, whatever. So I'd listen to them. I'd, if I put a CD in, it's a, and it's and it's also a little bit of effort. You have to take the CD out, put it in there, make sure it's uh, clean and all that, and stick it in there, and then listen to it. And you're like, oh, I'm going to listen to it for the whole thing. I'm not just going to listen to Numb and then switch to the Red Hot Chili Peppers album. And listen to Californication, you know. It, so it's yeah, more of a exactly. so the music had more value, which more monetary value as well. Everything kind of lines up back then. You'd you actually had to go and buy the CD and spend ten dollars or whatever, unless you were ripping it from LimeWire or whatever. You know, I guess we just we are we are not prepared to what's happening to us as civilization. It's very hard to adjust. Uh, we need way more time to adjust mentally. And also just as a model of society, because, as you said, we had no internet. When I was a kid, I had no internet and I had a few tape cassettes, like maybe a few dozen tape cassettes. And during summer uh, time, I was usually visiting the village, visiting my grandma, Mm -hmm. and I had my tape player and I had a few batteries. So I had to... I had to save my batteries f- to to last let's say I'm just listening to my favorite music for an hour a day mm-hmm. maximum mm-hmm. so I'm just waiting for a certain time of the day to truly enjoy something like let's say Alice Cooper Hey Stupid album oh, yeah, I'm going to yeah, listen yeah. to that mm-hmm. and I'm imagining like let's say a song I can clearly visualize the sofa in our summer house and myself listening to that specific album, to some specific song and enjoying the drum feels because the the drum sound was so huge. Yep. Like each each hit was like a gunshot and it was so amazing. By the way, Alice Cooper, Hey Stupid is a great example of songwriting. Mm-hmm. No fillers amazing amazing songs but also great musicians there steve Vai mm-hmm. was there mm-hmm. if i remember right every part bass keyboards i mean everything on that album is perfect and right now again i just cannot stress enough how lucky i was to go through that life experience having um having ability to enjoy music to its fullest mm. Understanding the value of music, but we take also it, having we take it for granted, the really. best of the best yeah. on my plate. Yeah, uh, yeah. And right now, we just we cannot stop the evolution. No. And of course, having having more is better than having less. Hmm. So the fact that you have internet, which is cheap, which is really available, everything is there. Let's say on YouTube, on Spotify, Bandcamp. Just Google what you want to find. You will find it. Mm-hmm. Is it is it good or bad? It's good on its own, but it plays a trick with our minds, with how we value things, because yeah. we always value things that are rare. Yeah. Let's say a computer mouse is a very simple thing for us now and a very cheap thing. But imagine if there was no mass production of computer mouses, how much would it cost? Mm-hmm. Same thing with music now. Everyone can make music, and there is no strict differentiation between an average band, 
an amateur band and really solid band and even a great band, there is no differentiation in, in terms of popularity. Average band that has great business strategy, great management, may become more famous than a really talented band mm -hmm. that has none of that, mm. who just write music and that's it. Mm -hmm. So we are living in the revolutionary times and it's hard for us to adjust. Maybe it will take another 20 years mm. or so to create a new model for us all. But I, I have never talked to someone who's, let's say, 20 years old or even 15 years old to understand their thinking behind enjoying music. Mm. Because I think we enjoyed music a totally different way. Yeah, The way we enjoyed it back in the day has transformed us into who we are now. Mm -hmm. So we cannot fully understand the younger audience, I think. Yeah, we'll have to find someone young and bring him on the podcast <laughs> yeah. and, and, and ask Agreed. them, you know, because no, it's like you say, like, um, I can't really imagine how they'd think about music. I, you'd have to talk to them and, and, and see what their, the answers are, you know, like. That might be eye-opening, actually, yeah, for us. Yeah. <laughs> or it might be depressing, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. It will definitely be depressing. Yeah, maybe. I'm sure. No, I mean, <laughs> it's it's like the AI conversation. We've talked about this a lot. Like, I'm doing a lot of AI stuff. You can't, like, yeah, you can have a, a huge argument about, oh, it's taking the soul out of music or this or that or blah, blah, blah. Like, a hundred, you could come up with a list of a hundred things. But at the end of the day, it's happening. It's going to happen. Yeah. You're seeing, if you watch TV, you're seeing... AI being added into every single product, every single ad, you know, like you have a washing machine. Oh, now with AI, blah, 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 for a washing machine, you know, like AI fridge, AI phone, AI, everything, everything is, is going to be there. So you can't escape it. So you might as well make the most of it. That doesn't mean you have to just completely start making robotic songs. Yes, but of course. Uh, figure I mean, out a way to make it work. Uh, I, I think we should not complain it. And I don't want to sound as if I'm complaining I'm complaining a tiny little bit, a tiny, tiny bit, because no, I, me too. <laughs> I, I, I really, I really know how much fun it is to get a great, fresh CD from my stepfather, and to open it for the first time, and to smell the the fresh paint, and then you you start listening to that album, and you open oh, up the booklet, and there's and you're the reading the lyrics and the lyrics, and it's just an experience. And nothing, <laughs> nothing exists in the world at this at that moment. It's just no, you no, and no, the no, music, yeah. mm -hmm. and the pure joy of it. And and of course, it's harder for us to experience that. It's still possible, but I think it's it's like growing up. It's like you know, when you were a kid, you had your mom cooking for you and cleaning for you, mm -hmm. and you didn't have to earn money, you didn't, didn't have to think about paying the rent and paying the taxes and this and that. Now you're growing up and you're going to do that by yourself, yeah. but there's nothing to be said about. Same with us as a society, as, as the civilization. Okay, things are changing. Now we have, have AI, we have internet, lots of things. More responsibility, life is harder, but at the same time, you have way more um, things in your arsenal to let's say, write great music and produce great music. And, well, you had to study management then. If if you write great songs and you say that, okay, the market is oversaturated and I'm... If I was living in the 70s, I would probably be popular. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would not be popular in the 70s. Maybe you would be the same complaining, whiny, <laughs> you know, loser who just doesn't know how to act with the music he wrote mm -hmm. so i think internet is a great thing we gotta just take the best from the current days and also take the best from the past from the past days because music was truly more complex there was more thought put into music back then because people were not so obsessed with content back mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. people were taking time to write great music and to impress someone they actually had to create an amazing album. When when you're when you're reading books about all those, let's say Led Zeppelin's mm -hmm. "Terribly to Heaven," mm -hmm. the story behind the song, how they were writing this song, how they were recording this song, you realize that all those people were thinking popularity equals quality, equals talent 
back then we were discussing who's the best guitarist, who's the most skillful guitarist, mm -hmm. whose singer has the best range and best stage performance, Freddie Mercury or Robert Plant, mm. who's your favorite guitarist, Brian May, who's very intelligent, British gentleman, or let's say Richie Blackmore, who is also very British, but he's like crazy and a little insecure <laughs> and, you know, he's more of a yep. bad guy, mm -hmm. so to say. Or maybe Tony Ayomi <laughs> with yeah. his satanic mustache and, you know. So what I'm saying is that learning to enjoy things that you have, even though you have so much happening at the same time, just attacking your attention from various angles you yeah. open up the internet and you have all those links just you know all those images on youtube all those suggestions you got to learn to slightly to ignore it and to concentrate on the things you really seek for well, really that, like that's the funny thing the funny thing is like the way that we consumed music when we were younger the whole thing we just talked about of sitting with a walkman and listening to a cd from start to finish yeah technically that can all still be done you know, I could do yes, that right exactly. now. I could do that tomorrow. I could wake up in the morning and make a, a conscious, active decision to just not do anything else and just listen to some music. But as a society, because of the internet, because of... It's like in video game culture, right? In video game, game culture, we used to just play video games as kids. We just open Super Mario. There's no... Uh, you don't know the cheat codes because there's no internet. You don't know... Uh, the most efficient way of doing things, you know? Yeah. In video game, game culture now, everything is about efficiency. It's about uh, making the most progress, earning the most gold, whatever, depending on the game you're playing, yeah. in the least amount of time. Fastest speed speedrun. Yeah. Like crazy speedruns exactly. using glitches. Yeah. So, so it's that same mentality applied to our lives, but everything in our lives now. now like now... It feels like a waste of time to just, oh, I'm just going to sit down and just listen to music for an hour and appreciate just the music. And although that's actually extremely valuable in terms of your development and like your, your taste yes. and all that stuff and your emotional feelings, you know, in like... Fact, uh, in fact, as you said it, um, I realized I, I'm almost unable to do that, to force myself into doing that because there's always something happening. I just have a bad habit, let's say... Let me check my phone real quick. Yeah, and that's it. You're lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so what? What I love doing when I when I have uh, when I'm working in my workshop on my hobby, uh, I take a couple of favorite albums from my let's say late teenage years, something that resonated with me when I was younger, and I'm just listening to that when I'm working with my hands. So mm -hmm. I had just have let's say some mechanism or let's say, a few things to do. Mm -hmm. And I just put the earphones on and I'm listening to that great album. And all of a sudden, I return to the past. Mm. And all those emotions, all that quality of listening. And it's it's a double-edged sword, so to say. On one side, you got to be a good listener. And on another side, there's got to be a great composer for those two things to click. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I think maybe also m so many people these days uh, struggle to enjoy quality listening mm. because it's quite hard to find a really great artist who has lots of great songs. Some artists have a few hits and loads of fillers. Mm -hmm. Some other artists probably, I don't know, don't even rely on songwriting, but more on the music videos, on the stage presence yeah. and and so on. So listening 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 in I'd say as it is without visualizing things. Because these days it's not enough to just record the album. You gotta make a few music music videos. Mm -hmm. Otherwise no one's gonna listen to the album. Mm -hmm. So the art of listening is struggling these days I, I i'm not saying it's dead but it's almost there yeah it's just so hard to to, to put that much time and effort into something nowadays i mean it, it shouldn't be so how do we solve it how do we solve it just, as composers how should we compose to uh, you know to 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 force people into our music i'm not sure if you can i think because look yeah. the, the all of the all of the great music is still out there all of the really great music, people can choose to listen to it if they want to. So 
it's not about uh, writing better songs. The songs are already great. There's so many great songs. I think it's just you you can't get people, uh, or you need to figure out a way to get people to actually do what we did and just truly can not. I almost use the word consume, not consume the music, experience the music. You know, consume yeah, is the that's problem. That's a better word. You know, <laughs> it's just we've been trained to use the word consume as as if things are like because that's what things are now. I think they're to be consumed. Yes, you get a everything. single. Get a new uh, single again, from a band, listen to a week, and then move to the next single, next single, next single, next band, and just, you know. Yeah, that's it. And you forget the previous one, which changes the way oh. you, again, the way you store information in your head. Yeah. So with, I remember, man, we sound like old farts. No, no, I, I, I don't, I don't, th I think the thing is, we're not coming from a place of, Oh, this generation sucks. The music sucks. No, yeah. I'm not saying that. The, I don't the, think the, so. the music is good. There's there's good musicians out there. There are good bands out there. It's just literally the fact that I listened to my Linkin Park CDs millions of times. Not millions of times, thousands mm -hmm. of times. Um, I truly, I could, I could, uh, in in my head, I can play the song from start to finish. You know, every single detail, every single note, every single sound. You know, I've. Uh, Linkin Park, they they went to the studio, they worked for months, made an album, right, that they were really proud of. And I truly gave that album the respect and attention it warrants. And I'd, and I'd say that's true for, for, for any band or artist or song you like. It shouldn't just Absolutely. be a thing of uh, you listen to it for a week and then you completely forget about it. I think there, there are zero, there are probably zero albums maybe even zero maybe not zero songs but zero albums that were created with a consumer uh consumer mindset so to say as consumables yeah it hadn't as yet disposables. the culture hasn't yet changed yet yeah you, you got to give it everything you got and even more you got to really experience the music you're writing to let the audience experience that music by listening again. And that's probably the energy exchange that the greatest stage bands are able to uh, to create um, during the live shows. I was never able to do that, of course. I'm not experienced as a live musician, but I've heard my some of my favorite bands live, and I felt that it's a thing, like that energy... Mm. Because uh, we, us humans, we are very um, collectively, um, um, I don't know how to say it, driven probably. So we are collective animals, species. Mm -hmm. We are not uh, like cats, for example. We need approval and we, uh, we feel the audience, we feel uh, the surrounding. And that what makes... A great show great same with songs i think a great song has to come from the heart even though it sounds very cheesy yep. to say that but it does have to come from the subconscious part of you that was shaped by all the things that you learned through the years not only as a musician but also as a human being all the experiences you had And those experienced, uh, as those experiences, you, you you learned to transform them into music, by writing music, by playing the instrument, by singing. You learned to communicate via music, and the the more complex you are as a person, and the more tools you have as a musician to tell the story, with notes, with chords, with rhythms with voices and with lyrics the more precise your story becomes so that ability to express the inner inner feelings even without describing the feelings in detail but just having something within you that you can very intuitively very instinctively transform into notes and rhythms and lyrics. Mm -hmm. That's what makes a great composer great. And again, I haven't watched interviews with some of the greatest composers. It would be interesting to know how much they analyze 
or how much they just you know grab the instrument and start playing without yeah. thinking without giving it a second thought yeah well we can we can kind of now that you've mentioned that exact thing i think we can kind of shift to talking slightly about uh, our approaches so now we we've kind of got an understanding of our backgrounds of uh, how we got into music how we got into uh, melodies and actually analyzing the songs that we like and how that happened and i think we're i think our, our kind of our tastes and our pasts are, are fairly sim uh, similar to be honest i mean both starting with the beatles kind of both kind of starting around the ages of like 10 11 12 around that um so let's talk a little bit shifting from exactly what you just said let's shift into talking about our songwriting approaches so when you start writing a song uh, when you sit down to write a song or do you even sit down to write a song what is your process to write a song <laughs> <clears throat> Do you do what you just said with like uh, I, someone sitting down I with an instrument or Yeah, uh I mean right now I realize that the more chaotic I am the better it is. So I agree. if I just have some riff playing or some melody playing on the back of my head when I'm doing something mm -hmm. when I'm cleaning the room mm -hmm. or when I'm taking a shower I'm trying to memorize it and then then I make a quick draft Mm -hmm. And if that the process of making a draft moves me further, sometimes I finish a song, sometimes I finish a verse and a chorus, sometimes just a few riffs, then I just I feel like okay, I've done with I'm done with riffs. I don't feel like doing anything more right now. I'll just keep it for mm -hmm. for a while. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll return to it later to make a to write a a, a, a a vocal line or something. But before that, in my let's say in my early to late 20s when i was working not only as a producer but also as the midi maker i was picking mm -hmm. music by ear and writing it down as midi and it was used in karaoke machines and as ringtones and mm -hmm. cell phones and there were some other applications i was actually listening to lots and lots of different music and i was very efficient in writing music just with my mouse mm -hmm. on the note staff and yep. in the piano roll in my DAW. So I was writing music like that and I wrote lots of songs like that just in MIDI. Mm. But what I realized that those songs are usually less playable and they are usually a little less sincere because there is more thinking Uh, the the chain from your brain to the resulting sounds is longer. You have to use your mouse and your finger and you yep. uh, choose the notes and velocities and mm -hmm. choose the instruments and mm -hmm. this and that. But when you grab a guitar or let's mm -hmm. say when you grab a microphone, mm -hmm. you can be very spontaneous with what you compose. Yeah, you stop thinking completely. You just yeah spit out pure musical ideas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and again you don't think about mistakes because mm. mistakes matter nothing mm -hmm. mistake means just you'll delete the take you'll start all over that's it but uh unnecessary thinking completely blocks the process of creation mm. we're talking right now we're also in the process of creation we are less experienced as talkers mm -hmm. that's why we talk not as good as we compose, right? <laughs> But that's the same process of creation. We're not choosing, okay, let me form this sentence using this rule and that rule, and I'll use this word. Maybe I'll use another word. Not sure. You will never deliver a thought. You yeah. will never get the message through if it's, you think too much, if you overanalyze. It's the same thing as, as yeah, it's the same thing as songwriting. Like when... Um, when you're first starting, before you've ever written a single song, before you've ever done yeah. a single mix, before you've recorded uh, any bands, any instrument, you're always going to overthink things. You know, you're going to overthink, you're going to form a plan in your head of, I should do this and then this and then this and then this and then this. I should use these specific numbers, these specific ways of doing things. Yeah, that's and, the process of learning. Yeah, and it's not until you've just 
done it time and time and time and time and time and time and time again to where you exactly. stop thinking about that stuff and you just go for it. And it's the same with us us talking. Like we haven't done yeah. a chat show before. We haven't done a talking show before. But I'm sure the difference between episode two and episode 200 will be massive. You know? <laughs> oh, yes. And that's why we are actually allowing all the errors and all the mistakes to happen. Yeah. And that's why we are, I, I guess we are at the very, very beginning of our, you know, uh, Journey. career as yeah yeah of a journey but that's very important right now and also yeah imagine the driver imagine the driving school so you're driving the car for the very first time yeah and then imagine a professional race driver who doesn't even think about pedals and about no. shifting gears about you yeah. and and the way he uses brake pedal and gas pedal and steering is very counterintuitive for us because it's not just pure logic. You want to mm. turn right, you turn the steering wheel right. You yeah. want to stop, you press the brake pedal. There's way more in that. And that's how your brain will function in every um, art or every profession in everything you do when you become experienced. Yeah. So what I'm describing right now, like just grabbing the microphone and singing a vocal line, and maybe if it's not the best vocal line, I delete it and then just sing another vocal line. And usually that's it. And that's the the best approach for me right now. And I think I also remember Michael Jackson interview. He used to beatbox some mm. of his greatest yeah, yeah. songs. Mm -hmm. So he didn't he need an instrument. He was a great singer. And the whole body of his was very rhythmical, of course, being a, an amazing dancer. So he just grabbed the microphone or... The recording machine, I don't know what he was using, the portative studio, and he just started beatboxing the riffs. And then they, they were using it in the studio to play a song, an actual song, to arrange yeah. the song. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best way to compose, best yep. way. And if you are not a singer, you can use the instrument that you're most fluent at, because that instrument is the least of a barrier between your initial thought and the music well, it's a, that has a, to happen. A great ex example of that exact thing you said is uh, I sent you a song recently, uh, which we did together. And for the, the solo, I don't yeah. play guitar, you're a guitarist. So for the, we, we did a song and I'd written a guitar solo in MIDI with a synth, hadn't I? And I just tried to do some like some basic pitch shifts and bends to kind of demonstrate yeah. what I was looking for. And you did an amazing job. Great. But then we did another song recently, which you haven't mixed yet, and I've just sent it to you. But for this one, I just said, oh, screw it, I'm not going to bother with the, the synth and the MIDI because I can't express exactly what I'm looking for yes. enough. I could. If I spent ages programming the MIDI and the bends and the exact vibratos, I'm like, oh, I don't want to bother with that. I'm just going to sing it into this mic here and just send it to Max, and it'll sound like crap, but I don't care. That's but No, 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 <laughs> that's the best thing. And, and you see... The thought that it's going to sound like crap didn't stop you because you know that I will understand you and yeah. you just need the the shortest way possible because you don't want any blocks on your way. But the thing... And actually, when I'm in the... Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go one ahead, more go little ahead. thing. Mm, uh, right about... Exactly about that. When I'm in the vocal booth and I'm writing the vocal line uh, for my new song, let's say, and then, then there is a solo right after the culmination... And I imagine the notes, the first notes of the solo. So I'm just singing. And, and I keep it for, for, for the future. When I'll be recording guitar, I'll listen to that little draft and I'll just copy it with guitar. Yeah. I was going to say, like, like that example you just gave of just like humming, wah, 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 whatever. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so funny to me how... When we first start, right, in music, we're so embarrassed about everything. We get so embarrassed yeah. and some, everything is so important. Like, I remember when, first, when I first started uh, doing recording and mixing, sometimes you get, I get really uh, amateur, I was an amateur, but I get amateur musicians and something as simple as like, hey, can you just sing something, anything into the mic so I can set the gain? And they're just so embarrassed, like, oh, no, I don't know what to sing. What am I going to do? Oh, you know? yeah, exactly. It's just like, just sing something, anything. You know? <laughs> but they're too embarrassed to do it. And I had certain people, just, they get so embarrassed or they feel like crying or whatever, you know, like, I'm like, and it's the same with us and songwriting. We're like so embarrassed, like, oh, what if my idea is like, I'd, at this point, I don't give a crap. I don't care about anything, you know, in terms exactly. of like being embarrassed. Like, 
I will just hum a random guitar solo completely out of tune into the microphone and send it to you without a second thought because yeah. um, because I can because I'm now a professional, you know, and because I know that you're a professional, I know that you understand that it's just a basic demo. It doesn't matter. It's just to get an idea across. So you're not going to judge me, yeah. you know. Exactly. It's just, uh, I was just thinking of that. It's funny, <laughs> and and especially for those who are not writing tunes for someone else but they're just writing tunes for their own projects mm. no one will ever notice if you do something silly yeah so go ahead and copy someone else's riff if you like it and then try to modify it a little bit yeah because that's how kids learned to talk one day uh, i i remember watching a video like a newborn kitten watching his mom <laughs> uh, grooming herself yeah and he was trying to imitate the movements. Yeah, I've seen that video. And he was falling every time he raised <laughs> the paw, he was falling yeah. down. That's how you learn. No other way. That's the mother nature. Yeah. So learn learning to compose for those for those of us who who, who struggled yet. And especially if you let's say if you're already good at riffs, but maybe you're not that good at well, let's say let's say explosive choruses. Mm. Right? Choose a chorus of your liking, your favorite band. You gotta have a reference. Well, the thing is, this when you're first starting out, there is no other choice because you don't have yeah. the repertoire of riffs and notes and what works and what scales work and that Absolutely. pure that pure original crea creativity. It just doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. The only way you reach that pure original creativity is by learning and copying and figuring out things, you know, and, and oh, they did this yeah. in this song, they switched from that chord to that chord, or when the chorus uh, came in, the switch and the difference between the pre-chorus and the chorus was something like this, oh, he went higher, oh, he went lower, oh, the tempo changed, or oh, the, the drummer switched from an open hi-hat to crashes, you know, like things like exactly. that. Exactly. You can only You've got to educate, copy. educate your NI, natural intelligence. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you you gotta it has to analyze a lot of data to start synthesizing something of its own yeah yes exactly and actually the same thing with sound engineering with mixing first you're using lots of references and you're mm. maybe maybe you're EQ matching the guitar tones because those guitars are so great and it's hard for uh, for, for many engineers who are like even like five years into mixing, it's it's quite hard to um, to mic up the cabinets and to EQ guitars without becoming tired very quickly of this complex noise um, EQ shape that electric guitars have. Mm -hmm. So I I referenced a lot and I copied a lot of tones as as, as mixing engineers, mm -hmm. but I don't need that now because I developed my inner like absolute hearing in terms of frequencies. The, the it's thing not we talked absolute, about but it's closer time, yeah. to absolute. Mm -hmm. The object and the, the objective understanding, you know, the objective understanding we talked about in last episode. The the understanding of what good is. You've developed that to yes. the point where you can make your own decisions. And also, and also understanding that. There are so many different approaches. Mm -hmm. you, you do not have to uh, to set the golden standard of guitar tone and just do that forever. Mm -mm. Yes, we are tempted to do that because some things just tend to sound better on most sources, mm -hmm. like a SM7B, for instance. But that's for us engineers. Mm -hmm. And I guess there are same things with some of the composers. There are things that just work. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to use the thing that is very unusual, yeah, and a little even a little off, a little wrong, to write a very special um, chorus or very special intro, or mm -hmm. to create a, a very special hook mm -hmm. that will make a song different, and in the mm -hmm. end will make the song more popular. So uh, I'd say making mistakes, uh, being not afraid to make mistakes, especially when you're just writing the song and writing the demo. And also, if you feel like you struggle with a certain part of the song, always, mm -hmm. like you have no problem to create the intro, mm -hmm. but you don't know how to develop the song into, I don't know, into, into maybe you're just like, 
My songs are all always intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo, chorus, coda. And I need something more than that. Mm-hmm. Then just start listening to your favorite bands and pay attention closely to how they are how they approach this problem, so to say. So how are they using bridges, how they are shifting from one tonality to another, mm-hmm. how they're using poses, maybe half tempos, maybe double tempos, culminations. Mm-hmm. What things are they using to make the song stand out? Maybe they're mm. just like Iron Maiden, for example. They may change the tempo completely if we're talking about metal. Although they're almost using only three to four chords Mm -hmm. and pentatonics. Very repetitive band in terms of the tools they're using as songwriters. But somehow they wrote so many super catchy songs. Yeah. It's a taste thing as well. Like, because for me personally, I couldn't couldn't write a seven minute prog song the way that you could you know i just couldn't do it cause probably yeah i'm i'm, well, I'm yeah I'm, but it's it's not even a taste it's more like a personal preference right you have great yeah. taste they probably also have a good taste and actually taste is also developed th- through through listening and through trying through yeah. imitation mostly yeah. yeah i mean for me for me personally i like you know i write fairly basic pop songs i like the basic kind of tried and true classic pop strunk pop structure of songwriting that's what i listen to yeah. like i listen to some but you you're I, talking in term basic in terms of classic pop music oh basic it's not simplistic yeah, yeah. it's just basic no, no. because basic it's in traditional terms of, basic in terms, in terms of, of when i say basic it's not to say it's bad basic in terms of the most classic structure that just works 99% of the time you know like yeah. it's just like uh, i don't know what this I've actually written articles about this in the past, about like the science of song structure, of like the um, why why is the classic pop structure intro verse pre chorus chorus uh, verse two pre chorus chorus bridge or solo chorus outro? You know, it's just a classic pop structure. You know, and it's like um, it just works. It works to keep uh, and uh, it's probably the most likely structure and format to deliver a song to someone so that they'll stay engaged from start to finish and it's just about the right length to keep people's attention for the full duration of the song and you know obviously you can do a 10 minute 20 minute dream theater song you know um and some people will love that you know it's not really my cup of tea for me i love dream theater but i like the hookier more poppy dream theater songs i agree pull pull me under you know i I, exactly (laughs) <laughs> well, me too. I, I I actually love Dream Theater for their catcher th- songs. Yeah, uh, because just, it's it's yeah. it's still prog, but it's very listenable, and you can enjoy the song in a in a, in a more traditional way, so to say. It's a personality I mean, thing, you know. It's yeah. just like for yeah. for me, although I love the musicianship, I can appreciate it. I would not listen to a twenty minute song. I just can't. I can't. I need the pop hooks. I need the. Uh, the whole thing of okay, you're introducing the song with an intro. You got the v- first verse. Introduce the story to people. Get people interested. Take it up a notch in the pre-chorus if you have a pre-chorus. Um, maybe high some higher notes to kind of give a shift in dynamic in emotion, and the chorus really explode to the point that the person and the chorus needs to be. Um, when I say explode, it doesn't necessarily have to literally explode with big sounds. It just needs to be the thing that is going to hook people, which is why we call it a hook, yeah. you know? And exactly. Then, and then verse two, go back to the verse, maybe develop the story a bit, you know, add some new elements into what you're talking about in the lyrics or add some variations in the instrumentation. And then second pre-chorus, third pre-chorus, and you're just adding some small things here and there to make the chorus bigger the second time. But then uh, by the time you've heard the, the chorus twice, you know, you've heard the first chorus, you've heard the second chorus, at this point you've kind of heard everything the, soffer, the song has to offer, you know? Or at least you think so. Which yeah, is exactly. why you then go in with a bridge or a solo to change things up and keep the interest, you know? And especially if if you have a very basic song, and I think that comes from the early days of... Yeah, definitely. Folk music, probably even. When you have lots of verses and a chorus that sums it up every couple of verses. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And maybe you have a little solo. 
so you you have that, which is great, and I, I'll I'll prefer a great basic song to a very very complicated and boring um, twenty minute song too. But uh, at the same time, I think it's always cool to uh, add a little something. I I don't know how how it's called in composing in, in composers terms, mm-hmm. but it's like a little uh, vocalized melody that everyone in the crowd could sing. Yeah, like a chant or... And me- memorize, a, yeah, memorize yeah. on the show and sing. It may be mm-hmm. a three-note something, like, mm. well, in my in my Sleeping King, it's oh, 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 just three to four notes. And I know that by the end of the song, people will probably sing it together with me, even if they haven't heard the song before. And I know that in pop music, they also like doing that sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So just a little hooky melody that is not a verse... Not a chorus. Yeah. It just let's say it's a vocal riff. Yeah, yeah. Of the song. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. But your songs in general, I f- I find that you're you're very hooky with the way that you write songs. Like a song oh, like thanks. Sleeping yeah. King is super catchy and memorable. I listen to it all the time. I really do. <laughs> or through the never, very very hooky chorus. Yeah, through through the never was. I mean, I wrote through the never before, right before I watched Interstellar. And then I watched Interstellar and I realized that this song is about the same thing Interstellar uh, is about as a movie. And I, I just keep keep seeing lots of similarities in different shapes of human art. So be it movies, be it songwriting, or let's say be it science as an act of creation. We have to 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 become great at certain sphere of life we have to learn a lot we have to copy a lot we have to gather information like to gather stones and then to throw stones so it's time to it's time i i don't know if it's a proper way to say it in english because i only know mm-hmm. the russian interpretation of mm-hmm. This phrase, but it's time to gather throw stones and then it's time to throw the stones yeah i get the idea if you have nothing to throw then you will throw nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's analysis and synthesis. I think it's described in certain sciences as that. Mm-hmm. Maybe in something mathematical, which I was studying as a student of cybernetics. Cybernetics. So first, any system has to analyze a lot of data, mm-hmm. and then it can synthesize this data mm-hmm. into some result. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So, in terms of um, writing songs, um, you—it's a thing. It's a—it's a matter of gathering those. I think, I, if I'm getting the metaphor correctly, gathering mm-hmm. the information, gathering the knowledge, gathering the uh, the understanding, and the the bank in your head of melodies of artists of what you like, what you don't like, and then just trying to turn that into something at the start, and then as you create fail miserably create fail a little bit less miserably create etc etc you just improve as time goes to the point where you're fully able to uh, merge all of that information all of your taste as a musician into something that actually works plus add your own taste and experience and uh, the things you like into that mixture and create something that's Let's say objectively good, you know. Absolutely, but also I think I've been thinking that I have never analyzed this metaphor about stones. Maybe it means an entirely different thing. For instance, for us as engineers, there was time when we were gathering equipment yep. and tools, and we were all about, "Hey, I don't have enough stuff." Yeah. And then when you gain enough experience, you're like, I have too much stuff. Yeah. I got to get rid of Are you throwing the stones amps away? <laughs> and unneeded plugins. Yeah. I will uninstall everything I don't need. I want to be super focused and only use mm. the things I need. And I think maybe it's the same with any other again any other branch of <laughs> I know that many people who are well, let's say I like I like building cars and in metal shaping, for instance, 
you can create very complex shape, metal shapes using complex tools and you can spend a for fortune on these tools mm -hmm. but some people use only basic tools and they are able to achieve amazing results with just hand tools and maybe mm -hmm. I don't know, a heater and a welder mm. and, and a grinder and that's it. So very, very rough example, but it has the same thing. It has so much com in common with, uh, with making music and with engineering. The great example in, in mixing is using SSL channel, yeah. which is so basic. It's not, it's not like a surgical EQ with like it's not like pro q but no. it gives you the best efficiency you can eq bass snare vocals i'm not sure i haven't tried it on the master but i think it would be also quite work quite quite effective no there i've i've done that for, on the master <laughs> <for boosting. laughs> oh yeah so there you go uh, and with songwriting i think it's also the same so when you know what things work for you the best, you will probably reach out for those uh, techniques in the first place when you yeah. want to write a catchy song. Yeah. I find, I find exact on, based on exactly what you're just saying, that, I mean, as, as I mentioned in the previous episode, I've written maybe 600, 700 songs at this point uh, and sold them all So and had good feedback from them. So I, th through doing that, you, you gain a certain level of confidence, right? And as you gain the confidence, like my level of confidence uh, between the first song I ever wrote and a song that I could write now, like if I could, I could turn off this this chat with you, and I could write a song in an hour or two, and it would be objectively good. And that's not an ego thing; it's just an experience yeah. thing, you know. In the same way that you can do a mix for me in an hour, or if I if I, if I asked you to do a mix for me in half an hour, you could still do a good mix. I'm sure you could. And it's just an experience thing, you know? So the difference between the first song I ever wrote and the song I could write now is staggering in terms of the way I approach it, the things I overthink, the things I don't overthink. You know, like now I am going for the simplistic tools. What you mentioned, like with working on cars and metal, like you can do amazing things with the simple tools if you know what you're doing. So uh, yeah. similar to you, you were saying you, you often just record like uh, a riff or a melody idea on on a phone or on laptop speaker or laptop microphone or just into your microphone and that's your basis your starting point for a song and i find that for me that's the same thing like um yeah. when i first started i might have sat down in front of the computer with the goal of okay today i'm gonna write a song i'm gonna write some music you know and you're starting from a blank page with nothing and you've got all these these MIDI libraries, these drum libraries, these synths, guitars, whatever. Yeah. And you just have to kind of note by note try and figure something out. And for me, that just doesn't work. <laughs> I've been there so many times. And and I ended up, you know what I ended up with? I was thinking, okay, right now I will spend some quality time and I will make a recording template for myself. And instead of writing a song, I was mm -hmm. starting actually mixing the non-existing song, like creating a great drum sound for yeah. myself and guitar tracks and everything. It will be my template. And then I got an intimidating template that was heavy and had quite a large latency. And it was clearly uncomfortable to write music in that template. Yeah. So uh, it's like with procrastination. When, when you subconsciously or consciously, con consciously think of some some um task that it's something very um unclear and, and and very complex and you haven't dealt with it before let's say you need to write a song and you're not experienced in writing the song you almost start inventing the auxiliary tasks for yourself that surround the main mm -hmm. task mm -hmm. so instead of writing a song you start changing the strings <laughs> for your guitar yeah. and you know tuning the guitar perfectly because you need to write a drop no just grab your guitar and record a rough demo and don't think about the tone don't think about anything you should be you writing a song but instead you're yeah, EQing the snare <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. exactly you mentioned a very important thing that you uh, that difference between your first song and 600th song 
and it's very important to to uh, to have you as as a specialist who monetizes songwriting mm-hmm. because I do not monetize songwriting. Mm-hmm. I'm the sound engineer. That's my bread and butter. But songwriting is just something I love doing, and I obviously know how to write songs, and I even do it regularly. Mm-hmm. But it's not like hundreds and hundreds of songs. Mm-hmm. So at this point, people might think that when you write a lot of songs you probably sacrifice quality and that's not true that's actually quite an opposite thing so when you're doing a lot of songwriting it's the same as if you're doing a lot of mixing it doesn't mean that you have a a limited pool of ideas and you're just exhausting that pool you're just no. draining that pool not at no all, yeah in, it's it's quite the opposite there there is an infinite pool of ideas yep you're just you're just improving the mechanism of creation yeah now the, the more that's it. the more i do it the better i get that's what i've seen you know yeah. like um for, for for me like uh simplicity is the 100 best thing you can do for songwriting but also um there has to be a spark for me the, the the key is i need to have a spark if i sit down with with nothing at all just be like okay today i have to write a song sit down and write a song most likely i'll end up with nothing and i'll just waste time but oh. if i'm just just if i'm just doing whatever you know if i'm in the shower if i'm cooking food whatever and i get a random melody idea pop into my head that i think yes, oh yes. that's catchy and i record it on my phone that's what i'd call a spark you know that's a spark mm. that will then turn into a full verse which will then trigger a pre-chorus which will then trigger a chorus which will then trigger a bridge which will then trigger oh i need these kind of guitars or i need this kind of drum sound that's the spark it's this tiny it can be a tiny little thing it can be a single word a single line whatever and the way the thing is like with the way i work in songwriting i'm usually writing songs on people's instrumentals so mainly primarily we get pop or, or edm artists uh, approaching me for songwriting and they usually have an instrumental that is a requirement for my my services you know like i don't mm-hmm. if someone has nothing um nothing at all then they just say hey i want a song like this then i'll offer them okay i can i can also offer music production and beat production or instrumental production service as well but in order before before i start writing a song uh, for someone i need to have a spark i need to have something that will spark an idea and and show me where to go that's the foundation you will be working you'll be building things upon yeah and the the, mm-hmm. the the tricky thing is sometimes the spark the the quality of the spark will change because if you're working with other people's music for example um i will turn down projects regularly the, i i i won't just accept any any song I need to hear a spark in it. Basically, it's one of my pre-requirements. I don't use that terminology when I'm talk- talking with people, but if when I get a message from someone saying, "Hey, I have this song. Can you can you write lyrics to it or write melody or get vocals on it?" I like, "Sure. Can you send me the song and I have a listen and I listen to it?" And if if I see any kind of spark anywhere in the song, most of the time I will accept I will I'll, I will accept it just because based off of experience, I know that I will be able to come up with something for that song. But if I listen to the song and it's just awful and I can't it doesn't trigger any kind of spark for me at all anywhere in the song I will usually just decline the project because I can't no, that's fair yeah there's nothing that's I can fair. do on that like I could do something but um conscientiously it wouldn't be good because I just I just like you can't write a good song on a truly truly awful instrumental it just doesn't work but mm-hmm. as long as there is some spark i know that i will make something that works and 99.9% of the time people are happy with the results but i need that spark you know i'd say that spark is a very useful thing uh for everyone who has uh, a luxury of uh, just writing songs in a relaxed manner like myself so i i usually don't have strict deadlines and i write more songs than i need mm-hmm. so each time i stop let's say i have a cool verse in my head and maybe a cool chorus but i don't know how i want this song to be developed mm-hmm. and i i almost never force myself into finishing the song so i don't really like brainstorming the songs 
I think it doesn't, it, really, it doesn't work. really work. If if instead it, it will happen yeah. naturally, if there's a spark there and it leads to something exactly. else, it will happen naturally. I'm just waiting for another spark. Yeah. And and usually uh, when you are thinking about a totally different thing, and that's why actually I think most of us need a hobby. So let's say if if music is your work, is a job, yeah. then at least if not a hobby, then a different activity. So for instance, cleaning the room, you'll take yeah. a shower, you're maintaining your car, anything. You're taking care of your pets, you're going to see your parents, any process when you are not really thinking about anything in particular, that's where this, when the spark happens. Yeah. And usually some sort of melody is just mm, sounds in my head. And sometimes that melody has something to do with other melody, or maybe I think, hey, it would make a great combination. Or maybe I'm, I'm, I'm singing <clears throat> a vocal line that I created, and, and finally I find the proper words for the vocal mm, line. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing I would love to cover, and I think it's important for all the songwriters, but also for all the musicians who are getting their stuff recorded later and mixed later, is uh, treating demos as demos. Mm-hmm. There are two approaches here. One approach, you are recording a very rough demo that will never end up in the final mix, will never be used as a recording that demo is just for you to reference to, to keep, to memorize the song. Yeah, uh, that's one thing. Another thing, if you are more or less a recording person, so you are recording your guitar, you have a nice microphone, a nice, say, DI box. Mm-hmm. You know how to record, and you are prone to demoitis. You're prone to that problem. <laughs> I created the demo. I like it, and I want to recreate it precisely. Yeah. If you are that kind of person, it's much better for you to instantly record things well. Yeah, I don't. I'm not do demos. talking record things perfectly, mm. but just have your guitar. I know it's a different thing from what I told you before, but it's also a different case. Yeah. So for me now, I realize that there are cases when my demo solo take or demo vocal take just sounds better. Therefore, and I know that re- I'm, record I have it well that enough, problem. You know? Yeah. I, I, it's my flaw. Mm. It's my flaw. I cannot let it go. Yeah. I got to learn to live with that flaw. Uh, that's why I I try when I re, when I record a demo. I I I usually try to record it well. Yeah, just in case you actually want to use that as the final take. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Or, or if if I just have a, have a phone in my hand, or or if I'm in a hurry, I will record a really bad demo on purpose. That yeah. Has, no chance of ending up in the final mix. <laughs> it will suck 100%, but it will just so you force yourself be a memo yeah. for yeah. myself. Yeah, but uh, I remember, I, I just saw a few days ago quite a fresh v- video from Rick Beato and he was interviewing um, extreme uh, Nuno Bettencourt guitarist. Yeah. And he told the same thing. He he made a demo with 12-string guitar. It's the first time he played 12-string guitar. Mm-hmm. And he loved the demo so much it ended up as as final rec- in the studio he just transfer tra- transferred the uh, Porta Studio tracks to the console to the large tape machine and they mixed it I guess mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. because that demo sounded right and I and I and I listened to the song it did sound right yeah not the best ever recording but the parts and the way they were played and sung they were right so. But but avoid anything in between those two approaches. So if you're recording a demo um, that's just average, most likely you will develop that demoitis. So the properly recorded song will just have a different feel to it. Yeah, and you will be tempted to change it to the point you lose the perspective and you will ruin the song. You will ruin the production. Yeah, and the audience you will be completely. Um, uh, torn away from the adequate perception of your song so the audience will just not understand you i've yeah. been there and this as a musician this also ties in with the thing we talked about before of doing things quickly so yeah. if if you if you're working for example you were just talking about like uh, before about me if if i've written 
500 songs and I can now write a song quickly, that means it's uh, that me- might mean it's less less quality or whatever. You know, people might think that oh, it's a lower quality because you haven't spent as much time. No, it's most likely higher quality because I've not spent yeah. as much time because I'm not focusing on crap. I'm focusing on what matters. I'm focusing on the idea, the pure the enjoyment you know this that that uh, feeling that that thing gave me you know same thing with yeah, demos exactly. so if you spend if you spend one month sitting on a demo that you did right and it's a crappy demo it's fairly average but you've listened to it 500 times you know you're so used to it now that now by the time you come right to do to the you. actual thing it sounds right to you and therefore you can't move on and like, I'm sure you've, you you were talking this week about like certain bands you work with that have been spending years on albums or singles or whatever you know and like yeah. I've had similar experiences I spent, yeah I spent 10 years on my second album yeah. and I've been through hell with it it's it's a horrible experience yeah I made a mistake and I know it and I, I do not recommend it to anyone I'm sure you'd agree that if you if you just somehow uh, manage to just completely just uh, get past all of your demo artists and all of those tendencies, you could have potentially written an album of equal quality in a month. You know, I'm sure you agree. Like, exactly, it, it's yes, completely yes, possible. Yes. Why not? And so again, when you're listening, uh, there are different modes of listening. So when you're listening, I'm able to listen to the song as. As a user, so to say, as mm-hmm. as, as as a fan, as uh, as an audience yeah. member, I can listen to that song as a musician, and I can listen to that song as the engineer, and it will be three different people listening to the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I even open Cubase session when someone asks me, "Hey man, check out the mix." I open the blank Cubase session and I import the track there because I know that I will listen to the song slightly differently mm. and I might grab the EQ and start EQing the process. It will be a totally different me. Mm-hmm. But when I'm listening to that song in, let's say, Winamp or on the phone, I'm listening to it as as a listener and I will notice different things, sometimes more valuable things. Yep. So... Um, it's very important to remember that you get to, as if if you are the leader of your band, let's say, if you are responsible for writing your songs, and if you want to have a proper vision, you got to <clears throat> preserve the audience pers- perspective, the audience yep. perception, and to do that, you 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 should not overdo the things. No. The best way so of doing that be, is to being just fast, work fast. You being know. fast, yes. Because when you're listening, why was, why, why did I start all this conversation about three perspectives of listening, like mm-hmm. audience, like musician, or as as a producer? Mm-hmm. Because when I start listening as the producer or as a musician to some of the best known classic rock or metal songs, some of them are really sloppy. Some of them are quite poorly produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those are great songs, and they give me amazing emotions as as a, as a as a listener. Yeah, still. So, uh, in preparation for this talk, um, we have a Google Documents uh, document where we have a couple of ideas of things we want to talk about. And something that came to my mind when you were talking about the whole audience perspective, musician perspective, uh, producer mixer perspective, is from these three things the thing that matters the most at the end of the day is the audience audience perspective because that's the thing that will determine whether the song is successful whether the song earns money and also yeah. how long the song is going to stick around for like i think last week we talked a little bit about modern day production and various like huge sounding metal mixes you'll hear on uh, on the radio on spotify whatever and like although you might say um in terms of technical mixing ability and the amount of space that is being carved out in a mix for everything to fit and everything to have maximum punch maximum impact you could say maybe we're at we're the best it's ever been in terms of um production quality you know yes absolutely like technically and i'm not talking about emotionally i'm talking about like purely mixing from a technical standpoint the the basses in in the songs you hear in in like modern kind of heavy metal and and rock songs and like these anthemic kind of mainstream songs the bass is super heavy and punchy the kicks are massive the snares are massive everything is huge sounding and the balances are better and the tuning is perfect you know things are just 
perfect, perfect. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent perfect. Yes, but but does the song stick around for as long as the old songs did in our minds? In in not just in our in our personal listening in in the music business in in general. Do the songs yeah. have the same longevity as like when an album like Thriller from Michael Jackson or a Fleetwood Mac album or whatever came out and it was in the charts exactly. for years? You know. <laughs> yeah, the thing is that we've been discussing Rick Rubin previously, yep. and him in the studio with Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, and they were tracking the bass line for Give It Away Now. Mm -hmm. And he was there and he said, keep it. I, I don't remember what he said exactly, but I think Rick Rubin is the perfect example of the producer who has the audience uh, perception turned on all the time, but he remains a producer at the same time. Yeah. And he's able to communicate with musicians at the same time. So he is like, mathematically speaking, a superposition of these three. Mm -hmm. Not just a combination, but he is able to communicate in between those th three modes of listening. And that's what makes a perfect producer, I guess. And to the point of being almost a songwriter mm -hmm. because he instantly knows what works for the song yeah because he hasn't lost the perspective of the audience he feels what uh the listener would enjoy more yeah. and people trust him because they know that he knows and speaking of perfect things the thing is that there is this old famous rule like 80% of result is 20% of effort yeah. and the remaining 20% of the result is 80% of effort. And right now we are struggling with those 80% of effort in everything we do. Mm -hmm. Production, performances. Mm -hmm. Speaking of performances, just imagine how hard it is now to record such a tight performance because everyone's editing stuff and when you're referencing to someone's, to someone's recording, they're usually heavily edited yep. and you're trying to match those heavy edited performances mm -hmm. while playing the unedited instrument mm -hmm. and you start hating yourself your self-esteem grows uh, gets lower and you feel miserable right yeah not the best way to write a song or to record a song what i'm saying is that you do not need to be 99.9 percent .9 good you mm. always got to know when to stop then you will very easily achieve all the goals. You'll be fast. You'll write great songs. You'll be satisfied with uh, with your results because you can edit things here and there, right? And uh, to me, again, I know I'm talking a lot about it. It's the same as with classic cars. People love these inefficient old cars. The paint job on them is usually worse. Mm -hmm. They are unsafe. They are not fuel efficient. They are not as comfortable, they are not as soundproof, they are not as perfect as modern cars. Mm -hmm. But somehow you have to be 99.99% good at everything correlated these days. Mm -hmm. And that's why all modern cars look more or less the same. They have more or less the same <clears throat> engineering behind them. And that's why there is less interest in cars as in art form, but more interest in cars as consumables. Mm -hmm. Same as with music. Yeah. No, I agree. So to bring the fun back, I think we got to know when to stop. When, when we reach this 80% and we move a bit further and then we just stop and we call it, call it a song or yeah. we call it a, a, a successfully recorded guitar take. Or we call it a great mix. Yeah, because at the at the end of the day, like who who analyzes this stuff in the audience? Like who truly analyzes it to the degree that an engineer or producer does? No one. Like, uh, well, yeah, I, I I have to I have to correct myself in a way. There are cases when you need a super polished production, or where, or where you need a a really really tight performance when the aim of the art is to create something very complex and, and highly polished, very, very, very tight. And, you know, in, in every art, there is a, th a thing like that. I think it's... it's, it's every form of art. It's that, but it's more the thing of, is it because of artistic reasons or, or is it because of habit? 
You exactly. Know? Whereas, so if if there is a reason to be perfectionist, then fine, go for it. Yeah, yeah, it's fine, but don't be perfectionist where it doesn't have to be. A great example is ginger vocal recording sessions. I know that Tatiana hates million of takes. Yeah, it just drains her her motivation to go on. So I never force her into more than three takes. I know that the first good take she'll make will be the lead vocal take, and the second take will be a double track. And I would never, I would never experience, uh, I I would never mm, practice perfectionism with her because yeah. it will be the wrong way to approach the artist like her. But it works for her. Yeah, it and it works. Totally works. And by the way, it works perfectly mm. because if if the note is a little sharp or a little flat, I can just tune that note easy and call it a day. Everyone does it. Yeah, that's but, why we need the tools for. But but think of think of the. Uh, the boost in energy and uh, what would you call it authenticity that she's getting from not having to do a million takes and worry she's just doing what she exactly. does the song that she's written you know it's just exactly just and, go for and it. actually if it was like 1985 I wouldn't even have to tune her because everyone back then was sounding a little off yeah the standards because of the standards you'd, you'd just use those takes it's, and they'd be great the modern standards. they'd be fantastic just the modern standards yeah. right yeah. So it's a thing of like we've just people just getting used to the, all of the the perfection in timing, tuning, uh tone, these kind of things. EQ um, curves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in terms of like let's just have a little bit of a discussion of how important are these things in relation to each other? How important do you really think like how important is songwriting in relation to performance in relation to technical things? Well, uh, again, each genre has certain specifications when it comes to performance quality, for instance. So I wouldn't, I would, I, I actually don't mind when the performance isn't very good when it comes to, say, Iggy Pop song, of course, <laughs> or or something like that, or or the Who show, for instance. With with drummer being completely shot and missing the hits, but it, that's the the part of the fun, right? The seventies music was like that. When it comes to modern music, modern music has to be again. The, these are the standards. It has to be polished, but it's very easy to polish uh, a, a nice performance. You don't have to demand a singer to hit each tone, each note. In, in zero sense you don't have to be completely on the grid as a drummer you actually don't have to be on the grid even after the editing only if it's heavily synth ba- based song then the drums have to hit precisely on the grid uh, but I think that songwriting the genres that have lost understanding that songwriting is the key those genres will experience a crisis. Mm. So as soon as certain genre, let's say gent music maybe, maybe some modern progressive genre, maybe even like power metal, as soon as you stop prioritizing songwriting over production, you're getting lost in a very, very destructive cycle of improving things that no one will even notice or value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, People it's... will still prefer those great albums. Take any genre, take Jen, they will probably prefer older Meshuga albums because they are kick-ass. Or yeah. you take Power Metal, they will probably prefer the first Avantasia. Avantasia. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it's spelt. Yeah, Av- Av- Avantasia probably. Yeah, but or maybe maybe earlier Camelot or maybe earlier Halloween just because mm-hmm. they were full of energy yeah. if you if you listen to that song analyzing how it's mixed it's usually like a horrible mix from the modern standards but it doesn't matter it's a great mix because the song works perfectly how how come these songs work so great even now if production would be more important than songwriting this song wouldn't be Loved, but they yeah. are loved even more now well, than I, before. I think in a lot of cases nowadays, the production is more 
upfront than the songwriting with a lot of the stuff. Like, I know that's a bit of a generalization, but that's how I feel. Like, I, there's just not as much music that I'm truly into. You know, I love the Production, sonics of it. Yeah. I love the sonics of it. It sounds great, but like, I, it won't stick with me for as long. Sometimes I even think maybe, maybe it, maybe that's the root of the problem. I mean, maybe too good of a production removes what's hidden in there. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an extreme example. Um, the song that's recorded not so well, but it, you're listening a bad tape copy, and you really enjoy the song, mm. but it's partially hidden behind the hum and distorted a little bit mm -hmm. and maybe you're listening on a cheap stereo system that mm -hmm. doesn't sound too good but the song is, is it's it's haunting you it's so interesting mm. and you have no access to internet you can't listen to it on youtube or in 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 greater quality in general mm -hmm. it but it will probably give make you more interested in what's behind the song mm. and also watching some of the movies older movies that are covered in grain or watching it on tv or watching the v vhs cassette you will imagine more than you see directly and that will uh, that will probably awaken your imagination and stimu stimulate your imagination mm -hmm. in a very nice way It's like reading a, reading a book. You only see the letters. It's just letters. Nothing. There are even no pictures. But mm -hmm. the the things that you can imagine are endless. Mm -hmm. So to me, sometimes having a perfect production is like having a 4K 60 FPS super high quality monster in the horror movie. You see every little detail of the monster, and now this monster doesn't scare you at all. Yeah. Because it's just you know it's it, it's in all detail in front of you, mm. and the greatest fear is fear of the of the unknown. Yeah, a lot of the and scary watching all those older horror movies when you just see something in the dark yeah. creeping and it scares you to cause, death because you're imagining what it could be. Whereas like when you actually see it, oh, you know, it's, just, it's CG and it's smooth and whatever, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's um, why I love lots of delays in vocals. I like covering delays in vocals. I just love that it it it. It not not just because it covers some of the vocals, uh, it doesn't really cover because vocals are so heavily compressed these days. But all those ambiences, they uh, distract you from the dry sound. So, uh, on this exact same top topic of like perfection, um, maybe mo in modern music, in in various cases, the production and the quality of the mix is kind of more upfront. Than the songwriting, and maybe if you took away that production and that uh, super kind of pristine, clear mixing, maybe the song wouldn't hold up in the same way, you know. But I was just thinking about like uh, the Mutt Lang, for example. We talked about Mutt Lang very, very briefly in the previous episode as well, I think. Yeah. But um, we were talking about production for the sake of production or production as an artistic choice you know that the pristine perfect thing as an artistic choice and if you think of a guy like matt lang so matt lang did back in black with uh, acdc you know which i'd say is really great it's not a pristine album it sounds fantastic but it's not like edited to death and like i think mo i think most of back in black is the bat is the band playing live with brian johnson most singing likely, on top yes. you know mm -hmm. So, Mutt Lang produced that album. It sounds that way. It's perfect. It's one of the best-selling albums of all time. I'm sure you agree it's a fantastic album. Move from that to the Def Leppard albums that he did, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where he actively decided to go for a much more perfectionistic route. But not just for the sake of it. They wanted to do something. You know, they wanted to do something and achieve something that hadn't been done before. And uh, because of that... Uh, perfectionist, perfectionistic way that they approached that album, it kind of set a precedent going forwards. It kind of changed the way that producers and bands think of the way metal and rock sounds, you know? And then after uh, Pyromania and Hysteria, you have the Black Album, for example, not produced yeah. produced by Bob Rock, but uh, or uh, Motley Crue, uh, those albums, you know, Dr. Feelgood and all that. And the, the shift in sound between 
like before band, uh, albums like Pyromania and Hysteria and after is drastic. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, oh, let's just make it perfect just because. They were, they were trying to do something artistic there. But the songs were also fantastic. That's the key. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point you made, made because, yeah, those were the times when you could make the revolution in trends, in how the songs not just sound, but also how the songs feel by producing and mixing them in different way. Mm. Right now, uh, there are actually no revolutions happening in the way, at least in metal. Okay, not I'm for a while. Yeah, yeah, metal, it's been a while. So I'm, I'm talking metal. The way songs are produced for the last, I think, 20 years, we're just slowly improving the existing rules that mm -hmm. were there already in mm -hmm. the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So there are no revolution there. It's not like there, there were no drum samples, then in the 80s they appeared. They, there were no digital reverbs, then they appeared. And we have all those yeah. explosive snares and huge vocals and this and that. So right now we are actually very limited in what we can do to make the mix interesting. And usually, unfortunately, when the band wants an interesting mix, they usually say like, hey, let's try something dirty, for instance. Let's try mm. something acoustic. Yeah, because that's the thing. We, that's how you can yeah. get furthest away from the current kind of standard. Because the current yeah, standard is super again, overproduced that's not the and new big. Thing. They're yeah. just the, the reinvented old thing. Yeah. And I'm not blaming the bands. I'm not... I'm, because then I would have to blame myself as much. I'm saying that right now we are witnessing that rock music and metal music has turned into classic academic music. That's the same thing that happened with jazz, for instance. Once it was young, it was very experimental, no one was playing jazz before, everything happened for the first time. Same with metal or rock music in general. Things were happening for the first time for decades, and now there are no new things left to... You, you want to try combination, try synth with, with metal, has happened. Try acoustic things with metal, happened. Try symphonic things with metal, happened. Try making it sound as bad as possible, happened many times. Try make it sound super complex and advanced, happened. Try simplifying it, happened. Everything has happened already. So we are actually working within the uh within within the range of very wide range but within the range of established approaches and that's why i don't think that production these days is more important than songwriting because the only thing we have left that may be still interesting in metal is songwriting and and when I say that, let's say the band has a signature sound to them, usually that signature sound that the band has has more to do with the way they write songs than oh, produce yeah. songs. Mm -hmm. So they might use a very specific set of, let's say, really low tuning and very, very pure, clean and, and, and almost like non-rock female voice. So that's their thing. I, I wouldn't call it production. I would rather call it the style they mm -hmm. write their songs in. Mm -hmm. So there's that. That's why I think now songwriting is more important than production. But if one day there will be a genius born, a younger person who will discover a new way of, let's say, recording and mixing yeah. uh, rock music, I will be very happy to witness it. But yeah. I just I cannot imagine it, unfortunately. I mean, the the best possible cure if if that's the right word the best possible cure or uh, solution i can think of is just as i said the the whole working fast thing i really do think just working fast focusing on ideas and uh, spontaneity is potentially oh, yeah. the the best possible way you can overcome all of this stuff just cuz it will random things will start random happening random things yep yeah Random, unplanned things. So you don't have too much time to think about, oh, what tone should I do? Oh, I want to sound like this band, or I want to sound like that band, or drums, or whatever, or just anything. You can apply it to anything in the yeah. song. So just like. Let me try a million different lyrics. <laughs> 
for a chorus. You have to no, yeah. You have to just yeah. do some some odd things, some things that are screwed up. I mean, that's how all the good that's stuff very much, comes. You know, actually, that's very much like a, a complicated client who demands endless revisions. Mm. So you should not be that hyper demanding client uh, for yourself. So sometimes you are your own worst enemy. And why am I calling this approach? Uh, an unfriendly approach. Why I'm saying that such a way is the way of the enemy. I mean that when the client keeps overanalyzing things, he's usually just ruining the mix and ruining the song. And instead of thinking, let's try every possible way to mix the hi-hat, you gotta think, Hi-hat sounds okay. We move on. We move to the bass guitar. Who gives a crap this sounds about great. the hi-hat? Yeah. Like, truly, honestly, like, <laughs> Who from, cares? An audience, from an audience perspective, yeah. no, no one in your audience is listening to your hi-hat. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> they might enjoy the bass tone if it's cool, but they will definitely, they will never analyze, hey, it has a little bit too much of 2.2K. Let's remove it 1 dB. Huh. But but even if they hate your bass tone, even if they absolutely, like it's the worst bass tone in the history of bass tones and they absolutely hate yeah. it, they might still listen to your song and like your song. Let's say there is no the song bass, is good. like in Metallica no, album. Yeah. <laughs> they will it's, still that's love a, that's a good example. that album. Do people yeah. hate the one album, the Just and Justice for All album, because yeah. it has no bass? No, they don't. You know, people still love the album. It's an iconic album, you know? You could, you could, I'll say, I'll go this far. You could mute the drums, mute the bass, mute everything apart from just James Hetfield's voice and his guitar and people would still love that album because the songs are good. And that's what the song is. That's yeah. what you condensed. You condensed the whole thing to what the song is about. Yeah. is the foundation and the voice. And that should be amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's what really matters. Nothing else matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, that was, you're a smart guy, Max. That was a good transition into that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, honestly, like, that, yeah, that can sound extreme, what I'm saying, but that is the truth. It is the truth. Because you've, you've, you've had great um, singer songwriter kind of singers and artists from, from the beginning of this, the, the previous century, you know, like, and a lot of the time it was just more simple. It was just a singer yeah. uh, and, a, and a guitar or whatever. And those guys like, and those songs stand the test of time. And this isn't like, uh, like you, we often say this, like we're not just two old farts talking about like, oh, we hate modern production. Like, yeah. It's not like that. We like the modern production. It's just that we feel like something uh, I is, mean, is you know what? missing. You know what? I will give you a modern example, quite a mo modern example of, I was thinking... Uh, I was planning to give another early Beatles analogy to say, mm -hmm. like, imagine Beatles playing these early 60s silly songs before before all those complex albums with, like, really deep songwriting and all those girls screaming on top of the band. Yeah. And those, the huge popularity of Beatles, huge popularity. But let's take another, let's take a modern example. Let's take Billie Eilish and the bad mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is literally no production there as in terms of like complex mix structure, million synth. No, it's super simple. The riff is super simple and that super close whispering voice. And mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. And how that song worked. That's a great example. Worked like yeah. a charm. Yep. That's what we need to learn to do more. You take that and you apply that into the whole setting of maybe having huge guitars and huge mix and all that. But yeah, you need to have the two, you know, really. You know, and in order for it to truly, truly stand the test of time and become someone comes and releases an album that that lasts for more than a month, you know, like that's that's. Can you imagine uh, all the bands we love growing up and they spend all this time making the music and all this money and effort and everything. And they release it, and it get, gets listened to for a month, and then it's just forgotten about. Like, can you imagine? Like, how sad is that? And that's what's happening a lot these days. And it's a combination yes. of a lot of different things. But I honestly, truly do think it's a songwriting thing because a song like "Bad Guy" 
will mm -hmm. stand the test of time. Even though I'm not, I'm not a huge Billie Eilish fan, but I can recognize a great pop song when I hear one. You know, it's a, it's super catchy, it's memorable, yeah, so it's a, it's unique. Or L Lady Gaga's "Bad Romance." I just remember when that song appeared, and and I still kind of like the song, so I would love to rewatch the music video, even though it's quite old. Yeah. So we we are we haven't as as humans we haven't lost the ability to write catchy songs that will last. That's yeah. not something that's in the past. That's a normal thing even right now. We we're just we're just uh, going through a crisis, as I said before. I think it's just a crisis when we are uh, in the early stage of uh, social networks appearing and shortening the attention span more and more with TikTok. Like how many seconds are there in a TikTok video? Like ten, twenty. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. know. I don't use TikTok. I'm so but, old. <laughs> that's that's the thing we have to overcome and and later we'll develop certain mechanisms in our minds that will help us enjoy uh long lasting things again yeah yeah so i was there's that i was re i i saw an article or uh, news post this morning that, that katie perry has sold her music catalog you know sold the rights to her music catalog for like mm -hmm. 300 400 million dollars or something and it's like Katy Perry hasn't really done that many like huge hit songs in quite a while at this point. But the fact that someone is willing, maybe a record, I'm not sure who who bought it, but a record label is willing to buy her catalog for 400 million or something like that. That that shows that those songs, those huge hit songs that everyone knows, anyone can sing those songs. Yeah. Uh, there's still value in them and the record or whoever bought it still sees a huge amount of potential in uh in monetizing those songs whereas can you think of any like uh, i know it's kind of old farty old farty to say it but like uh can any of the recent metal bands sell their catalog for anything close to even a million you know like i don't think so yeah well i think songwriting i mean when i'm thinking of let's say an a, an averagely modern metal band let's take the genre that is not too modern just to you know to find the something in between the old fart thing and <laughs> current thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll take let's say a sympho metal with female vocals something like it was popular in the early late 90s early 2000s and back then, songs were way more simple. Think Night Wish or Within Temptation. Very mm -hmm. simple th songs. Mm -hmm. Right now, when you're producing a, a symphon metal female front and band, usually it's a nightmare because they have so much stuff going on there. It's almost impossible to listen. That it's definitely a flaw in songwriting because you do not do not need that. And I am not a songwriter. I'm a, I'm a producer. So I'm not entirely in a position to force them to change certain things sometimes i am and when i am i i i, I exercise that right to say hey let's remove the violin solo from the chorus because there's also a double bass drum and four layers of guitars and and piano solo also together with and it's a chorus guys and girls so uh what I'm saying is that so many bands that cannot really achieve financial success these days, they went too far into writing com complex music instead of just writing a music you can sing to. And and songwriting itself, I think if someone wants to buy a course, let's say you, you sell, let's say you make a course which is called Songwriting 101 and you sell it for a few bucks, I'm sure that most people who would want to by that book would be people who would like to write a popular song not the most complicated song mm -hmm. ever with the most virtuoso solo that would last for more than 10 minutes so maybe songwriting isn't about that unless it is about it, that so if your aim is to write complex music as we discussed before yeah. then by all means go for it do that but unfortunately that's that genre those genres of music were never popular yeah 
never popular, even in, even in, in the 70s. Because when we think prog rock and even when we think financially successful prog rock, we think Pink Floyd and Genesis. Yep. Both, most, uh, sorry, both bands did not overcomplicate their stuff in terms of songwriting. Genesis, Genesis has become, a huge amount of hooks. Yeah. Like ru- super catchy hooks. Super catchy? Actually quite simple. Think comfortably numb or yeah. the wall. Da, yeah. da, da, da. Three notes. That's super simple. They are prog because they write they are able to cover so many topics they are able to tell so many stories and they can combine lots of songs into one concept album and they are very coherent those songs they form a mm-hmm. whole story that can be told from probably 10 perspective from perspective of a kid who lost his father at war from of from the uh, point of a rock star who suffers bur- uh, heavy burnout and so on and so on or let's take genesis they become became really financially successful when they started ra- writing simple catchy songs actually pop songs mm-hmm. and they uh transformed all their prog experience and also all their studio experience into into that 80s sound they had with great samples yeah. and cool reverbs and everything but the songs that i can dance da 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 again two notes i can dance one note man just an octave and i i can instantly tell hey it's genesis chorus yeah but think of the difference that's songwriting like, Gen- yeah. genesis were successful before i mean they were successful when they were way progier we were and, and the a totally different level of being successful and the peter gabriel days and all that but yeah think of a song like i can't dance or invisible touch like invisible touch is invisible a pop song touch, that's a pop yeah. song oh, that's a complete 100 pop song again how many notes are there yeah just a few notes and it's and it's, it's it's fairly basic throughout you know there's some great sounds in there some really great synth sounds really great it all sounds fantastic of course the production is good but the the chorus how catchy the chorus is you know yeah. <laughs> combined with Phil actually, Collins' amazing voice actually solo peter peter gabriel in the 80s was also great really great but also like the it's pop you know yeah. uh, sledgehammer it's pop. sledgehammer it's like, pop. yeah sledgehammer it's exactly. it's it's very 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 well done pop. It sounds fantastic. That's a, such a great mix as well. For example, Sledgehammer, but like, it's pop. It's pure pop. Like, and think of the as, like you're saying the the difference, the jump in success and popularity between when they were doing very odd prog stuff in the early days, and then both Phil Collins and Peter Gabriel going and doing these massive pop hits. And like Pete, Phil Collins was one of the most successful pop artists of all time. Started in yeah. a prog a prog band as a drummer, you know, like as a drummer and and a great drummer who mm. played live amazing drum solos throughout the, his pop career, even yeah, if I'm not mistaken. But they, or let's they, take Queen, yeah, who started as a pop uh, as a um, rock band, but almost metal band from time to time. Yeah, we were but talking about that I, recently. <laughs> at the same time, they are actually a pop band in a way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. These these definitely. bands could have they could have stuck to just doing the more. Uh, more musically complex stuff. They could have stuck to doing it. They probably wouldn't have been as as successful. But you can see the difference in in success and uh, how much money they were earning and everything. The moment they started being more accessible, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like a lot of people, yes. f- with everything we're talking about, we're absolutely not saying like people can listen to whatever they want. People can do whatever they want because it's a personal taste and uh, just. It's all down to that, you know, like if someone likes a 20, 30 minute song, you know, like uh, various Dream Theater songs, like I've seen Dream Theater in, in concert, like I took my wife to give shout out to see Dream Theater <laughs> and, and, and it's oh, funny, fun, little, it's just funny because I, I like Dream Theater, but I, I, I'm more into the, the poppier kind of hooks, you know, in the songs and like it towards the middle of the concert, my, my wife, she's not very hugely into metal, like and she says, how many songs are left? I'm I'm just getting a little <laughs> bit bored. So I looked up the set list real quick. Oh, only three songs left. <laughs> but that was like that was like an hour and a half, you know? 
<laughs> so she was like, you yeah. lied to me. You said there are only three songs left. I'm like, that was three songs, but there's so many switches and that. But And this is perfectly fine to like that stuff. I have fr- some really close friends who are huge Dream Theater fans and they love the technica- technicality of it. But the simple reality of the, the matter is probably 99% of people on earth aren't that into that and they want the poppy the hooks the chorus the very the very um that that three and a half minute song structure i've talked about which just psychologically works yeah you can make the abba meme that everyone on the planet will understand but you cannot make the dream theater meme that everyone on the planet will understand And it comes from a person who would rather enjoy Dream Theater song than ABBA song in most of the time. I mean that not every uh, piece of art has to become famous, has to become like globally famous. No. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. And again, I would, pro- I'm, I'm even, what I, what I mean is that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to become famous I'd rather play metal songs that I enjoy personally. I don't want fame. So many artists and also many clients of mine, they don't really want fame. They just want to succeed at the genre of music they love. But the problem the problem there is in order for us as an audience members to hear these songs, they have to be they have to have a certain degree of success for us to even hear them in the first place because Yeah. Um if someone is just doing exactly what they want to do with absolutely no thought uh of popularity, mainstream, uh catchiness, these kind of things. And they might have some really good stuff in there, you know, in their in their seven minute, eight minute long song that is mostly instrumental with some great lead. They might have some great stuff in there that I'd like, you know. But chances are I'll never get to hear it simply because it's not accessible enough. Yeah. For, because now it's to get out all there. or nothing. Yeah. Right now, I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just silly and I don't know how things were in the past. But it seemed to me, at least I remember with our first album in 2009, 2010, labels were approaching us. Yeah. So even back then, it's not so far from now, things were different. Yeah. Right now is harder because of oversaturation and and other things and again limited attention span of the modern audiences yeah but uh still let's say you want to remain as a songwriter those who are listening probably listening to uh, to our to our discussion on songwriting hopefully um if you want to remain within the genre that you love mm-hmm. it would still be great to make yourself heard mm. as much as possible. Yeah. So maybe there is always a way to write a catcher song or two. Not maybe not a pop song, but just a catcher song. Maybe you are into catcher songs. You love like pop metal. Not pop metal in terms of like a blend of synths and like pop music and rock music. But I mean I mean metal that is written with popularity in mind. Let's yeah. say Guns, Guns N' Roses are mm. like hard rock with with pop in mind. They are not yeah. just your regular hard rock band. No, it's a, a Somehow pop, pop hard rock bands yeah. manage to be super popular. Like take ACDC. Mm. They have all the ingredients to become a, a hugely popular band. Yeah. Well, it's the same nowadays. Like uh, producers like producers and songwriters like Kevin Choco or Kane Choco, which I've I've talked mm-hmm. about a lot. I'm huge fans of theirs. The 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 bands that are the most successful in rock or metal, uh, financially and mainstream wise, like bands like Disturbed or Shine Down, you know, like these kind of bands that like they're doing hard rock pretty much, like somewhat like ACDC yeah. in, in terms of like the Sonics and all that, but they are really pop songs not not pop in terms of synths and, and all that but pop mentality in terms of how they structure mentality. the songs exactly you know um and again that ties that also ties back into the acdc and whole um def leppard thing because kevin worked with mutt lang for years as an engineer you know like so there's a, there's definitely 
uh, an influence there. Or guys like other people who are very successful or have been very successful within the rock and metal world in terms of taking rock and metal bands and making them mainstream. Guys like Joey Sturgis, you know? Uh, Joey mm-hmm. Sturgis has, has talked about Mutt Lang and Def Leppard in tons of interviews and stuff I've seen from him, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, or in the country world, guys like Billy Decker, he's always talking about Mutt Lang and Def Leppard with his drum sounds, you know? Like, And mm-hmm. you see that it all ties back to... It, it's funny how it all goes back to like the the that pop mentality of, yes, have the great production. And like guys like... Joey and Billy Decker and Kevin Joker, they all have very unique and great production and mixing styles. And but again, they're, they're, they're still applying the whole pop mentality yeah. that Mutt Lang had to the music they're you, making. You were talking about ACDC and Def Leppard, and especially ACDC. I, I just thought, again, that's the same old rule of uh, following, using the tools that work and following the same concept. Because many would accuse probably ACDC of being a bit self-repetitive. And same with Iron Maiden, same with other, let's say, the most successful metal bands. They might be a little repetitive. But if you think of that from the audience perspective, if I were a fan of Iron Maiden, I wouldn't want them to change the genre completely from album to album. It usually If I'm an artist, and, yeah. I would probably say, I want to evolve. I'm a totally different person now. That's why my third album will be a totally different genre. Well, duh. Then you will lose half of your audience, maybe even more, maybe all of your audience. Um, And uh, that's a natural thing. So again, probably if you are a good producer like Rick Rubin and you understand that a given band has a proper, a certain audience, he will probably try to keep the band away from questionable decisions, maybe, yeah. Yeah. to guide them a proper way. Uh, so popularity is just one part of the equation. If we want to include popularity in the equation we are building, then we have to follow certain rules. If, you are, if we are making music for a very niche audience, or even for ourselves, then we're just ignoring the audience requests completely and we will certainly not become popular. That's just the given fact. And maybe that's not a bad thing for some of us. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's uh, a very good point to, to potentially end this this first chat um, on songwriting about. <laughs> yeah. I think eventually we'll manage to squeeze into slightly shorter yeah. time frames, so but right now to, we have so many things to talk about. There's so much to talk about, and also just yeah. like we we have so, so much stuff in common. I find that we it just takes us in places, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, we we are still searching for that efficient meth- method to deliver information. We will get there eventually. Yeah. I do think that's a very good place to to end the conversation. I think you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I think we've we've covered a lot of stuff. The thing is, as you said at the very beginning of this conversation, songwriting, the topic of songwriting, it's not like more technical mixing uh, or recording or whatever. Where, where you could say there are correct ways of doing things. You know, like there is, like you you boost eight k for treble, you boost sixty hertz or eighty hertz or whatever for 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 low end or whatever. You can't really yeah. do that in songwriting. You can't. I can't. If someone comes to me and says, "I want to write a song, tell me exactly what to do," the stuff I'm, the advice I'm going to give is extremely vague in 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 comparison to if I was going to give mixing advice to someone. It's like, well, the- <laughs> I'd say I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'd say there are, uh, and I kind of regret I haven't said it before because we're wrapping it up. But uh, in fact, there are probably rules like if you're if you're analyzing and if you are. Um, uh, dissolving any popular ACDC or Iron Maiden song, uh, there will be probably a few chord progressions that were great. Uh, maybe some modulation to a, a tone up, a tone up for the solo, for the uplifting effect, and then going down again to return to the chorus. Then you're probably have some pentatonic scale to write a catchy uh, riff. Mm -hmm. So you can structurize it. Mm -hmm. But the same as with learning your native language, you cannot build your knowledge 
on these rules. First, you got to develop the basic instincts yeah. and certain feelings. And then by knowing all those rules, you will just reinforce what you feel with knowledge. Yeah. No, I agree completely. So you need to listen to a lot of music. That's that's the first thing. That's yeah. probably the most important thing to becoming a good a good songwriter. You need to listen to a lot of music, listen to a wide variety of music, even if it's not... I'm not saying go and listen to stuff you hate, but you need to have a good understanding because with me, for example, I don't pick and choose too much in terms of genre. I'll do whatever. Yeah. If someone wants a country song, yeah, I can do that because I've listened to a ton of country yeah. and I like a lot and of actually, country. There were countless times when I hated some genre yeah. of music and then I started listening and I realized that I I, I I hated it rationally. It's cool. It's not that bad. Yeah. Well it's it's the thing of it's the whole when you when you first get into music, you first get into rock or metal, for example, you, you kind of uh, it without uh, consciously deciding to do so, you kind of somewhat some people at least it happened to me, kind of develop a little bit of an elitism simply because that's the first thing that you fell in love with. Oh, I love yeah. you. And you're like you're like 10 or 11 years old, so you're not like... Exactly. Oh, that's Even smart. if you're 16 years old, <laughs> yeah. you'll probably think, hey, this solo has million notes and that country solo has three notes, that's mm, why metal is sucks, better. man. That's a terrible solo. It only has three notes. <laughs> yeah, terrible no, but, solo. He has such an expensive guitar and he only plays three notes. Loser. Yep, terrible. Why people hate play him millions, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But 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 then after a certain point you realize that really the main reason you like a lot of that rock and metal music is because it has a great chorus or it has great lyrics, you know, or a great melody. Yeah. And then you think exactly. oh actually a lot of those country songs have great lyrics and great melodies, you know? Or great choruses. So it's just the package around the core essence, which is yeah. that spark, which is that idea, which is that that kind of pop. And when we say pop, I'm not talking about a jo a, the genre of pop. I'm talking about popular, just music that most people yeah. will connect to and like. So yeah, it's you, like a show top of the pops, and everyone's been there, like Deep oh, yeah, Purple, yeah. been there, and, yeah. and so on and so on and so yeah. on. Yeah, exactly. So you need to listen to a lot of music, have a lot of uh, a lot of references in your head for various things, and like. A lot of melodies. So, because of the fact that we've we've listened to thousands and thousands of melodies, when I when it comes to writing a song, I can pull little bits and pieces, and every song I ever write is going to be a Frankenstein of my influences and my tastes. There's no yeah. other way that it can it can be, you know, because every, everything's been done before. So any anything particular thing that I'm doing is most likely just my subconscious saying. Oh, there was that one note that Freddie Mercury sang in that in that one song, or that one little exactly, thing that exactly. someone did. Yeah, you know. So and and then and then someone else who is also into songwriting might recognize your personal preferences. It's like the other day when I was listening to the pop punk song you wrote, mm -hmm. which should be a very American pop punk simple tune, and to me it sounds sounded super British, a little bit like <laughs> Queen in the chorus. Yeah, and I think that's the beauty of it because you can uh, encode and decode certain uh, emotions and so even certain uh, note progressions you can encode feelings into them and then you can decode them back yep no I agree 100% listening so influences listening to a ton of stuff gaining a bank in your head and then we talked about I'm just kind of summarizing the things we've talked about yeah, just for, for making people, mistakes finally. trying things making mistakes you need to screw up you 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 will your first the the first thing you do whatever you're doing the first song you write the first mix you do the first recording you do the first anything you do the first painting you do whatever nothing will ever be perfect and most likely it won't even be anywhere near good that's just the exactly, truth exactly yeah so you have to make the crappy painting, the crappy mix, the crappy recording, the crappy song, and then the next one you improve, you improve, you improve, improve, and you get to a point where Each you... Each time you fail means that next time will be better. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Number three, another thing we talked about is just the, the way we approach writing songs. For me personally, I can't sit in front of a computer and decide to write a song with nothing to start with. Most of the time, it won't work. I need a spark, something to start with. That can be a melody, a lyric, whatever that I've come up with 
literally when we were talking, you were talking, you were talking about this as well. Like when you're doing cars, uh, working on your car, or whatever. When I'm doing something completely unrelated to music, is usually when I'll get an idea. If I'm cooking, exactly. if I'm in the shower, if I'm in, working in the garden, whatever, I'll get a spark. Or a spark doesn't even necessarily have to be a melody or an idea that you get in my head. I might hear uh, a sample, a specific snare sample. I might hear a snare sample and the sound and tone of that snare. For example, if it's like an 80s kind of white noisy kind of big snare, that snare sample might then trigger a, a melody in my head simply because it puts me in that mood of oh 80s and and uh, big reverb and all that you know yeah or because or your brain that works that way you you might recall hey back to the future was in the 80s that movie and the mm. movie had a plot and that plot will give you a little a lyric, phrase yeah, or, or something. something exactly and that phrase will turn into a chorus mm. no i i agree 100% yeah. that's exactly what happens so and and also even when you get that spark it doesn't have to be you start with the intro then the verse then the pre-chorus it doesn't have to be like in order as well like yeah. sometimes the spark will be uh, a guitar solo at the end of the song and then you'll just start with that and you'll build your way backwards and fill in the blanks or you can start with a verse and then after the verse logically you just get ideas for what the pre-chorus could be and then you progress or backwards or I will anyway tell you. I will tell you that I remember the exact street I was walking on when I had that first line of the Sleeping King chorus in my head, like, when all the dreams are torn up. I was just walking down the street, and I remember the process of walking. That's what you uh, told me in the very beginning of of our conversation. Like, you can remember the exact, exact things that were happening that are connected to certain musical pieces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's just how our brains are wired. Our brains are very complex. They are still very black boxish for most of us, and mm. they are definitely not perfect tools for certain tasks. We are not. We were not created to directly to write music. So we are not machines for writing music. But our brains are so flexible that we can train our systems to be super efficient at any given task. And to do that, we have to to do a lot of that. Yeah. There's just no other way to become efficient. Maybe you don't have to be efficient songwriter. Maybe you don't have to write 600 songs or 6,000 songs eventually. But unfortunately, I think there is no other way to write that one multi-platinum hit. Mm. Yeah. Unless you're super lucky. Yeah. Unless unless so it happens that your personal preferences and maybe the singer you work with and maybe something else just combines into a situation when you write a bad guy, for yeah. instance. Yeah. Or bad romance or give me, give me, give me or any other huge song that comes to my mind right now. No, and that's another extra one that I'd add to the list, which is you can't, not every song can be the greatest song you've ever written. It just doesn't work like that. You can't you can't say, okay, this song I'm going to write now is going to be the greatest song I've ever done. Because it doesn't work like that. You just do whatever comes to you. You fill in the pieces. You One spark leads to another. And the song is what it is. You know, you can improve yeah. it or you can make it worse. Like, there are definitely things you can do. But you just have to, you have to uh, work fairly quickly, work fast and not get too precious about one single song, which is something we talk about a lot with like the clients we work with um, in terms of mixing or whatever. Like People yeah. will put so much effort and time and mental kind of uh, mental ram, let's say, onto a single song. It is their entire life, their whole career, their whole life. Everything they've ever done has led up to this moment. This song is the big culmination of everything <laughs> I am. Yeah. Like, mate, just... Do the song, do the best job you can, release it and move on to the next one. It exactly. doesn't it doesn't matter if it's not the greatest song of all time because it's the best you could possibly do at that moment. You know, you can't you can't be better than your best. You can't be better than your best. As long as you're doing your best and you're not messing around, just do it, release it and move on and you will improve with time. And as you say, you can't it's it's a combination of 
tons of different things that will lead to that eventual greatest song you've ever written. But you can't formalize it. Yeah. Also, in, in your head, the song I imagined as a blob, like a, a, a circle. And within that circle, there are certain concepts and understandings like, oh, it's unfinished. It's very complicated. I'm not happy with the recording. Or let's say, I think this song is a masterpiece. It has to have millions of views on YouTube. And there's that blob. And that song is still unreleased. And this blob is just getting more and more pressure within it. Pressure. The thing is that you have to finalize the song to really understand what's going on, to, to get out of, of that circle to to get outside the circle and to really understand the the scale of 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 the big picture otherwise you'll just you're just most most likely you'll just leave within uh, you'll just spend too much time too much effort being within that uh i don't know if it's the right word blob i've i've witnessed this i'm sure you've witnessed this both with bands and personally Um, like with your second album, for example, like I was saying, you could have probably made an equally good, an equally good but different album yes. within three months, and it you wouldn't be. And at the result, at the end of it, you would have saved yourself nine years of emotional distress. Absolutely. I mean, I finished recording and editing the album in 2016, and I released it in 2022. Yeah. I could have mixed it in 2016. It would be a worse mix, maybe, but it would be the same album. Mm. I would have really. I had the artwork. I had everything. I had the lineup. It would be a totally different story. I don't regret because there is no reason to regret things. But It's I done. definitely learned from this yeah. negative experience. Yeah, yeah. The I've I've worked with artists before that have just gone crazy about a song for for years or. Uh, extreme demoitis as we talked about and then by the end of it there's there's no joy left in the project there's no there's no enjoyment there's none of that original excitement that there was when you first wrote the melody or the lyric or the whatever yeah. it is it also is a heavily distorted perspective of how yeah. it looks it has songs. truly become and turned into a product at that point It's no longer a, a thing that you loved, that you just came up with an idea one day and you were excited and you're like, oh, I love this song. At the end of it, you no longer love the song. You don't want to hear that damn song ever again. You don't feel the song. No. Nah. You, you don't feel the song. You don't understand how the audience will feel it because you don't feel it. The, the, the feelings that you have towards this song are solely based on those countless hours and days spent on polishing it and remaking it and... I, I think that the the base the biggest the biggest thing you feel towards the song is I want this song to get done already. I just want it to be be out of my life. I'm unhappy with it, so I cannot really finish it because I spent so much time on it. It has to be perfect, and I don't know how to make it perfect anymore. And that's the first furthest thing that can be away far from what you want the audience to feel. Mm. Mm. But also, but also, like I know, I know we're trying to finish this up. But just, just one last yeah. point: like your mentality and the way you feel emotionally affects everything in your life. Every single thing you do, your relationship with your relationships with people. Yeah, that's true. Things like your eating habits, your sleeping habits, uh, your your just your everything. Your entire approach to life that's is true. is affected by by your mood a lot of the time you know like mm -hmm. if you if you're spending years and years and years overthinking about a song and it's just become a big a big kind of blob as you say in your mind a big thing is just stuck there and you can't get out of it it's just it affects everything for years whereas if you have the the mentality of just of just uh, progress over perfection uh, producing things constantly finishing things constantly there's as a musician you know there's no greater feeling than than finishing something regardless Absolutely. of how regardless of how perfect it is or or not you know as long as you're happy with the thing you've done to a certain degree you might not may not be completely happy but as i said before you can't be better than your best at a, in a single moment in time if you are only one year into songwriting you cannot write a song like Max Martin writes a song. It's not going to happen. It's impossible, you know? So you're better off just 
be happy with what you've done. Be, be uh, realize the the progress you've made. See how far you've come. Yeah, you might have things you want to improve, but release it, and you'll get that that rush of of excitement, energy, inspiration, and yeah. and also you'll get the the what do you say? You'll you'll feel the need to go further on the next song. You'll be like, okay, that song is done and it's out of my life. I'm now going to move on to the next one, and you have a refreshment, a complete like uh, zeroing out of your of all of your emotional stress and everything. You can start yeah, from scratch. Just imagine driving the open highway or driving slow, uh, and 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 there is a heavy truck in front of you yep. that you cannot just you know get through. So uh, that's a very correct thing you said regarding um, developing a proper habit. So it's important to develop a proper habit of finishing things and moving on as early as possible. Mm. Because I've been living with that blob of unfinished album for years and it did affect the way I, I even was working with clients. It did affect the way of me losing interest in playing instruments. And I realized right now that if I had someone wise and experienced near me, like some musician who was, let's say, way more experienced and had more um, weight than me, who would who would tell me what to do to to fix it. I would be way happier. I just had to go through all these errors by myself, like real horrors of remixing this thing for dozens of times for no reason, just because I I had that impulse of I hate it. I will start all over again. That's the wrong thing to do. And same thing, by the way, with songwriting. I think if you feel that the song isn't working, don't treat it as, as you said, as a precious little uh, something. Throw it away. That's Write a, another that's song. A, that's an amazing point. Like both, both in terms of like uh, you can you can just choose to cancel things, to scrap things, because it is not that valuable. It hasn't yet. You you can't know if a song is great or, or hugely valuable until it's out there in the world. People, other people will exactly. deter will determine that. You know, so if you, if you're not as precious to do with a song, if you haven't spent three years on a song, five years on a song, whatever, even three months on a song in in my book is a bit too much. You know, like because you just after a week, personally, I lose interest in a particular song. Yeah, you know, that's true. So if it's become so precious to you, then you don't want to throw it away as well. You, like, I've, I've been working on this for three years, but I just can't finish it, whatever. And just, maybe you should have thrown it away three years ago. Maybe it just it wasn't meant to be. On And throwing it away doesn't mean literally throwing it away, deleting it off your hard drives and then wiping your memory, <laughs> you know, of the yeah. song. It means maybe, maybe you just, it's not the right time. You come back to that idea in five years or randomly while yeah. you're cooking in the kitchen you'll get an idea maybe which when fixes you're 75 years old and you 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 have no ideas and you ran out of ideas and you want to make the farewell album <laughs> you'll take something <laughs> from that little folder of ditched songs and maybe you'll come up with the one idea that will fix the song and be like oh this is actually, what was meant to actually, happen actually yes actually and and also i remember i i was reading someone some someone's interview i don't remember the person but he said that he has lots of drafts in lots of folders with drafts but when he when writing the new album he he wants the fresh songs in there because he he wants fresh experiences mm. for that new album yeah. and that was the first time I, I i i read such a thought and and i realized that maybe writing loads of songs into the folder instead of just releasing them out is a very toxic idea mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I already have huge loads of songs structurized into albums like album three and album four. I have all these albums for years in my folders. And and it makes me demotivated. I, I'm not really, I don't feel like making these albums actually. I feel like they're valuable, but there is no joy in just producing because i produce for a living so there is no joy of producing these drafts yeah i'd love to write a fresh song it, instead it, it might be a cool approach to approach an album one song at a yeah. time literally not just like oh we have 10 ideas and then we're going to go to an album but literally 
approach an album from scratch just with one idea at a time and then finish yeah. an idea, move on to the next one. So each time you're starting from complete fresh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we need fresh. I mean, again, uh, one more old fart thing and we're done for today. Uh, back in the day, they were touring hard, like all those bands like Led Zeppelin, so on, they were releasing an album a year. Mm. And all those albums became classic, mm-hmm. like most of them. Yeah. And in addition to that, they were touring, for really hard touring, lots of lots of shows. And somehow, so the only way they could go through that, of course, l- 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 least amount of songs, like six, six, seven, eight songs, an album, less than 40 minutes total length, that helped a lot. But also I think that the, the, the fact that the ideas were fresh and they had no time to... Uh, I mean, probably they had some 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 demos they kept for for the next album that they used them later. But in general, yeah, there was just no time for them to store something for ten plus years. Yeah. But e- even then, maybe they weren't. Maybe it was just like Jimmy Page. Oh, record a little idea, and then that's you don't listen to the idea five hundred times a day. You know, you can have yeah. the ideas. There's nothing wrong with having ideas and keeping them stored. It's just yeah, not overthinking yes. them to the point that when you come to actually recording them, there's nothing left because you're so used to the demo. I mean, they had no time to polish. Exactly as you said. Yeah, you helped me phrase it right to properly word it. They did not overcook that idea yeah. to the point where it became unedible. Because you can you can keep an idea fresh, you know. Record an yeah. idea, and like I have lot tons of ideas and recorded on my phone. Uh, I can't remember any of them now, but I haven't. That's because I haven't listened to them for years, probably. But they're just little things for like maybe one day if I do need some kind of idea, I'll open it up and like, oh yeah, that's a cool idea. But it's not overcooked, as you say. It's not been overcooked because I've only heard it the time that I recorded it, and then it just yeah. stayed there as an idea. Anyway, I think that is. I think we've kind of gone through the various things we've... It's funny, yeah. we say, let's, let's, let's end the episode and then we talk for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that anecdote, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you definitely don't like seven-minute songs, but you like long podcasts. The same I don't know, me. it's it's just because it's fun, mate. It's fun talking about all this stuff. And yeah. like we're, we're passionate about songwriting and about music. And like at the end of the day, it's like you talked about uh, last, last episode that we did. We were, talk, we were talking about how this is somewhat a cure to our usual way of thinking of just overthinking and over editing as it is the case with most modern metal and all that and we're just just going for it and it's fun so why not <laughs> we but I, th- I we will try and shorten these i think in the future but that's yeah, uh, again, will... an experience thing we just need to go and see what happens yeah exactly exactly awesome so great talking with you max thanks a lot for I being likewise. a part of it <laughs> we'll meet in the next episode. <laughs> yep, very soon. Yep, another three hours. Well, we're trying to take yeah. it down to two hours next time. Anyway, yeah, we'll try it. Great times. Uh, good talking to you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye.